Hello. Started, but yeah, we don't have to, um, that's what I was. I don't know. Do you tell me when? Uh, yeah, we still got some people. People there. feel ready. Yeah, I, th I felt it was a little too. Okay. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yes, no? Oh, okay. You're waiting for me, yeah? All right. All right, everyone. I don't like squatting down here. Uh, welcome. I'm uh, thrilled to have you all here, both in person and uh, hopefully a number of people on Zoom uh, for, for today's talk and panel session. Uh, my name is Tom Braun. I am a professor on the Ann Arbor campus at the School of Public Health, and I'm here today as my role of chair of the Faculty Senate. Uh, this event today came out of discussions of one of the committees of the Faculty Senate. Um, get the acronym correct. Um, 
uh, academic, um, gosh, Academic Affairs Advisory Committee, AAAC, there we go, I was called AAAC. Um, and through their discussions came up with the idea of having um, a talk and a panel discussion like this. And so it's thrilling to see something like this come out of, out of faculty governance. So um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, as you know, there will be a talk and a short break after that talk, and then there will be a panel discussion of three individuals as well, four individuals. Um, one, two, three, three. Uh, it will be moderated not by me, but by the person I'm going to introduce next. And so uh, I want to talk about Fatma Gochuk, who is a professor of sociology and women's studies here on the Ann Arbor campus. Uh, her research focuses on the comparative analysis of history, politics, and gender in first and third worlds. She critically analyzes the impact of processes such as development, nationalism, religious movements, and collective violence on minorities. She has a number of books, uh, including Denial of Violence, Ottoman Past, Turkish Present, and Collective Violence Against the Armenians, 1789 to 2009. And she's a co-editor of a recent volume, Critical Approaches to Genocide, History, Politics, and Aesthetics of 1915, published uh, in 2023. Uh, and she is currently working on a theory book, Constructing Social Theory from the Vantage Point of Minorities. So if you would like to take the mic, welcome. Thank you so much for giving me the, uh, whoops, no, yes. Thank you so much for giving me uh, the opportunity at least uh, to introduce this amazing uh, panel. Uh, and uh, our speaker, uh, who is uh, also uh, very well known, but what's very interesting is that uh, addressing gender violence uh, is something that has been done a lot. But the institutional courage part is, I think, what's going to make this very unique. Because I also have found out that uh, in all my uh, attempts to minimize violence and bring about positive change, uh, institutions are very hard uh, to transform. And for that reason, I think uh, it is wonderful. And in addition, Jennifer Freight uh, is also the founder and president of the Center for Institutional Courage. So I commend you for your foresight uh, into that is, I think, what's going to, we need to bring about change. And uh, uh, Jennifer uh, Freight uh, is a researcher, author, edu educator, and speaker. He is the founder and president of the Center for Institutional Courage, Pro professor emeritus of psychology at the University of Oregon, and affiliated faculty, Women's Leadership Lab, at Stanford University. She is also the co-founder of the consulting firm, firm Alto Group. In recognition of her active service in the University of Oregon Faculty Senate, she received the Wayne T. Westling Award for University Leadership and Service in 2017. Freyd is widely published, is a widely published and renowned scholar uh, known for her theories of betrayal trauma institutional betrayal, institutional cover, uh, courage, and Darvo reactions to, by per perpetrators, that is, deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. She received her PhD in psychology from Stanford University, uh, the author of, or co-author of over 200 articles and op-eds. Uh, Freyd is also the author of the Harvard Press Award-winning book, Betrayal Trauma, the Logic of Forgetting Childhood Abuse. Her most recent book, uh, Blind to Betrayal, uh, co-authored with uh, Pamela Burrell, uh, was published by John Wiley with seven additional translations. In 2014, Freyd was invited two times to the U.S. White House due to her research on sexual assault and institutional betrayal. In 2021, Freyd and the University of Oregon settled Freight's precedent setting equal pay lawsuit. Wow, that took them a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and without further ado, uh, today's talk is uh, titled Addressing Gender Violence with Institutional Courage. And I give you Jennifer Freight. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here. Um, before I move to the next slide, I just want to put in a plug, and it's for the word emirate. Uh, this was one of my last acts of activism at the University of Oregon, and it is an attempt to de-gender the titles of retired faculty. Uh, we don't um, go around calling people um, Professor Et, and I don't see why we should add a binary gender title. So it's very simple. The Faculty Senate can presumably tell the administration that professors want to at least have this as an option. At the University of Oregon, um, by legislation, it's now, it's the default, but faculty can choose to use the title emeritus or emerita if they're attached to that, just like those of you who are still active faculty members can call yourself whatever you want to add to the end of the word professor, but the default's professor. So that's my plug for that. Um, Today what I'm going to do is um, briefly go through some background concepts, take you on a journey over 30 years, um, and how I came to be really focused on institutional courage. And then I will um, talk about institutional courage really with an eye towards what institutions can actually do in the here and now to improve the situation on various fronts, including preventing sexual violence. But first, um, I think it's something to do with age, but I've been reminiscing a lot. And I um, was thinking about all the times I've been to Ann Arbor over the years. And I did this little game with, my, um, with the search function on my CV to count different universities I've spoken at. And except for schools that I had a really clear affiliation with, the University of Michigan won. I have been here the most times. Um, and I, it goes all the way back to 1985 when I actually came for a job talk, got an offer, and probably foolishly turned it down. Um, but um, since then, I've, between 1990 and 2021, came back quite a few times. I think I counted half a dozen times to give talks. My guess is there was almost very little um, overlap in the audience for all these talks, and probably very few of you in the room today were it in these talks either, which kind of speaks to a, a general issue about um, universities, especially large universities, which is the way things are siloed. Um, and that then relates to the next point I want to make, which is among the ways I've connected with this university, in addition to giving talks, is I've been brought in a number of times as a consultant on lawsuits. Um, and I always get hired by, almost always get hired by the plaintiff's attorneys. There have been a number of lawsuits of students who have alleged that they've been harmed by the university, um, not just by an individual at the university, but by the university. And most recently, I was brought in um, by a plaintiff's lawyers to um, help design a structure that potentially could be helpful in addressing gender violence. I may be telling you something you already know all about, but because universities can be so siloed, I feel I should let you know this exists. Um, I was involved in the process up to the point where it was designed, not at all since then. I can't tell you anything about how it's gone other than, you know, I've asked people, but I really know very little. I can't promise it's, it's being helpful or not. It certainly was designed with an intention to be helpful um, in addressing this issue. And I also just want to say, I have many colleagues here. This is one of the places, and I think this is why I was, in, you know, speaking here so often. It's one of the places actually that has the strongest scholarship on um, gender in general, on sexual violence, and I know universities tend to not look at their own colleagues for help on matters that, where there's a potential application, but um, I mentioned only two because if I listed more, then I'd be leaving somebody out, and the two I mentioned are just people I've worked actually directly with. Um, on issues really relevant to what I'm going to be talking about today, and they, they're both here at the University of Michigan. All right, I'm going to go back now in time, um, really back to the early 1990s. I was um, at the time a cognitive psychologist focused on things very unrelated to trauma or sexual violence or gender. Um, but there was a lot of interest, um, and t the topic was touching me personally, of people's memory for traumas. And this set me on a journey. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. This was an article published in 1992 in the New York Times um, regarding somebody 
named Frank Fitzpatrick. And the article included, Frank Fitzpatrick began remembering having been sexually molested by a parish priest at age 12. Mr. Fitzpatrick retrieval of the repressed memories began, he said, when I was feeling a great mental pain. Mr. Fitzpatrick slowly realized that the mental pain was due to a betrayal of some kind and remembered the sound of heavy breathing. Then I realized I'd been sexually abused by someone I love, said Mr. Fitzpatrick. But it was not until two weeks later that he suddenly remembered the priest, the Reverend James R. Porter. Uh, this case caught my attention. First of all, I had already named my idea of betrayal trauma theory by 1992. But also, um, it was a special case because um, there was eventually a successful criminal conviction of the Reverend James R. Porter, and dozens and dozens of victims had come forward um, who also said that they had been abused. And um, there was even a taped admission from um, Porter. So it was a very strong case. It was very unusual. It led to a successful criminal prosecution because usually statute of limitations don't allow that. But in this case, in the state of Massachusetts, it did happen. And he actually served prison time, which is even more unusual. Um, it was very interesting, though, that the case, the people that came forward, and there were dozens and dozens, I think it was over 100, actually, had been living with the memory of what had happened to them for more than 30 years. There were some others, like Fitzpatrick, who had forgotten and then remembered. But it was Fitzpatrick who had a very profound kind of forgetting and sudden remembering that opened the case up. Um, and I think this relates to the way if you forget and then you remember, you have the crisis of awareness of betrayal. And it's really a brand new, a brand new experience. So for Fitzpatrick, it was acute. And he was able to, he was actually trained as an insurance adjuster, which means he had some investigative abilities. And he, was, he actually um, sort of started the investigation. OK, I was this memory psychologist, and nothing I had learned prepared me to account for this. Um, yeah, people forget and remember. That's what memory psychologists study. But nothing quite like this. So um, I wondered, why would individuals remain unaware of or forget traumas they'd experienced? And a very closely related question to that is, why are some traumas forgotten and not others? Can we explain the phenomenon and can we make predictions about where we're most likely to see this occurring? And the answer that I developed, I came to call betrayal trauma theory. The basic crux of the idea here is um, to consider two things about humanity, um, our, you know, our species. One is our exquisite sensitivity to betrayal. We really feel betrayal when we feel it. It's, it's, a, it's a very hot cognition. That is, it's very emotional for us. Not only that, if you look at the conflicts in the world, if you look at art, if you look at almost anything, it's about betrayal. Betrayal really grips us. It really matters. We're highly social. And because we're highly social, we depend on social contracts all the time, implicit and explicit. Every time we have a social contract, we are at risk of we, we, we must trust, and we are at risk of having our trust violated, and that is betrayal. And so it behooves us to be really aware of it, and to have a strong reaction, and to take a protective action, because we have to keep interacting with the same people. If they have exploited our trust, they are wasting our resources, they are endangering us, we better do something about it. Well, what do we do? We have a two choices, typically. We confront or we withdraw. We demand to make it right. We start a war. We start a divorce proceeding. We switch airline allegiances, whatever it is. Or we leave. And we say, I'm done with you. And we walk away. It's kind of like fight or flight, although you know, biologically it's different. It's at a different sort of level of organization. But those are our two choices when we are empowered. And hold that in mind, when we are empowered. At the same time, perhaps even more profoundly true for us and many of our biological relatives is that we are extremely dependent. And this dependency is most profound, you could say, in infancy. Humans are born relatively prematurely in terms of the animal world. They can't do anything. Um, this is all in my mind right now because um, I am a proud new grandparent. I have been 
very involved with the raising of this new board, and I have my, I just want to cry sometimes when I see the utter and total vulnerability of this child. If the child is left out in the yard in suburban Seattle for five minutes, he can die from predators and other dangers. It, it is an enormous kind of resource requirement to keep a human infant alive. And this goes on for years, as you know, you all know. It, it goes on for years. And <coughs> this re the nature of this relationship is the caregiver gives resources to this dependent other. Huge amounts of resources. And it seems like it's asymmetric, and in a certain way it's highly asymmetric, but it's reciprocal too, because the caregiver gets rewarded by the infant's behavior. And if the infant cannot reward the caregiver, that infant's in trouble. What's the reward? We are biologically programmed to find rewarding attachment behaviors. The infant makes eye contact. The infant makes adorable cooing sounds. At some point um, within between the first and second month, the infant starts to smile. This fills us with so much joy, it's better than chocolate. And we keep giving and giving and giving. And this relationship goes on and develops, and we think of it not as my attachment system, but as love. Love is a system that promotes two kinds of behaviors, um, which is to, in, is to approach and then have positive engagement. These behaviors are the opposite of what betrayal detection promotes. And herein lies the bind. And I want to just add to, especially Americans think that, that dependency ends, you know, at some age. Um, it doesn't. We're dependent our whole life on others, and sometimes extremely so, but we always are dependent on the infrastructure around us in the world that we live, um, and our government, and all the institutions, and we'll come back to institutions. But betrayal trauma theory hones in on a particular response to this bind, which is betrayal blindness. So what are you going to do when you've got a conflict between a system that tells you to withdraw or confront and a system that tells you to approach and engage? The approach and engagement is actually more important. If you're really dependent, you're not empowered. You can't afford to do the betrayal response because your situation's going to get worse. In that situation, you need to let the attachment system have the upper hand. How does the attachment system do that? When there's what, what uh, some psychologists call cheater detectors pinging off, it does it, according to betrayal trauma theory, by suppressing information about betrayal. By suppressing that information, you're allowed to stay in the relationship, engage in a way that engenders the continued caregiving. This is the crux of, this, of the theory, and I call this betrayal blindness. And I would say betrayal blindness is a survival mechanism. Um, it does have costs, but it can keep people alive. People that can't use it can often die because they cannot keep the caregiver hooked in and engaged. Think about not only the child and a parent, but think about a dependent partner in a, relation, in a marriage where there's asymmetry in resources. Think about an employee with a boss when the employee really needs that job. And think about a citizen in a country and a person in a church and an athlete on a team. And you can start to see how those dynamics can play out in those situations as well. There is a long run cost because suppressing awareness of reality comes at a cost. It gets you, keeps you alive now, but down the road it makes it harder to know who's trustworthy or not. It makes it harder to, to engage in healthy relationships. Um, it makes it much harder to stop ongoing abuse. So betrayal trauma theory also suggests two primary dimensions of traumatic stress. Historically, Trauma was seen as really associated with terror and fear. And the understanding of long-lasting trauma problems like PTSD was really understood in large part in the terms of the biology of fear, which has pretty profound neuro neurological effects. Um, and indeed, 
fear is really relevant to why trauma can be so devastating for people. But betrayal trauma theory highlights a separate and orthogonal dimension of betrayal, social betrayal. And um, you can think about how certain events can be high in one of these dimensions and low in another. And I would submit that traumas are those that are high in either dimension or both dimensions. And if they're high in both, those tend to be very likely traumas to really derail people. We've researched this now um, for over 20 years and um, have found that um, high betrayal when trying to hold constant statistically the amount of terror and fear inducing elements, that high betrayal is associated with a large host of uh, symptoms. Um, depression, anxiety, in addition to the forgetting we initially started with, like we predicted there'd be more forgetting and indeed there was, but also all sorts of other symptoms. Um, including physical symptoms, um, physical illness, and um, behavior issues, problematic substance use, and tragically re-victimization. People who are good at suppressing knowledge of betrayal are more likely to be betrayed, because they don't see it. Um, we also found some pretty striking gender effects. Men and women have about equal rates of trauma overall in study after study, but particular kinds of trauma vary quite a bit by gender. And we find that, that uh, men and boys are more likely to be safe, um, so, uh, victims of accidents, natural disasters, and attacks by complete strangers. Whereas women and girls are more likely to be victims of um, close interpersonal violations. I'm going to move now to institutional betrayal. Um, institutional betrayal became my focus um, now about 15 years ago. And all along I kept thinking about things like the Holocaust and other examples of where the, the perpetrator it was more than an individual. But you know, psychology focuses on individuals. So it wasn't the first place I started, but I came to it. Because, partly because of my experience as being a university professor and hearing from students about what happened to them. And the institution was always implicated. Um, and the idea of institutional betrayal is basically that our attachment system's probably working with institutions. Because just like with a parent that a child's dependent on, we depend on institutions. Furthermore, we often trust them and we can love them. People tend to love their schools and their churches and their teams and often they love their countries which can be extended to loving their government or their, their leaders. Um, there's the attachment system operating and it's very human, it's fine, um, but it does make us vulnerable to betrayal. And I would say it makes us vulnerable to betrayal blindness. But we needed an empirical handle on this. Um, so first we had to define institutional betrayal. And we defined it as institutions harming those dependent on the institution. And, and importantly, this includes the failure to prevent or respond supportively to wrongdoings within the institution when there's a reasonable expectation of protection. Most of our big major institutions um, are designed to protect us or offer um, claim that they protect us. So hospitals and you know, law enforcement and the government are explicitly designed to protect us, but um, even schools will say, they'll put it in their advertising, that one of the things they do is protect us. In the first empirical um, research on this, published um, in 2013, but um, you know, projects take a while, the data were collected more in around 2010 with Carly Smith, who was a new student in my laboratory and determined to get an empirical handle on this. Um, we measured three things, sexual assault experiences using other people's measures, trauma symptoms using other people's measures, but then we had to create a measure for institutional betrayal. And Carly took the lead for this and basically it works as a checklist. If somebody says they've had, uh, and, and we focused on sexual violations, if somebody said they'd had a sexual violation, we asked them was there an institution involved and if so, did the institution take certain actions? And these actions um, ranged from things that were failure to prevent um, to bad responses afterwards. Um, including punishing people in some way for having gone through this experience. And uh, I, initially we were going to do this at the time there was news reports about 
um, what was going on in the U.S. military, and people would say things like, I, w I joined the military to help my country, but um, I, you know, I, I signed up, and then I got sexually assaulted, and that was terrible. But what was even worse was what happened when I tried to do something about it. If somebody says something's worse than sexual assault, you've got to stop and say, wow, because sexual assault's terrible, and it's worse than sexual assault. So we said, this is actually institutional betrayal. So we had this idea we were going to do this study in the military context, and then we found out that wasn't actually so easy. <laughs> U.S. military wasn't so keen on that, but um, so we did what we do when we did our study on campus, and I thought we're going to pick up a little bit because students had told me stories. There's some out there, but you know, colleges are warm, fuzzy places, and the adults that work in colleges love students. It's just going to be a little bit, 46 percent, and we keep seeing numbers hovering between 40 and 50 percent in the educational context. Yeah, of people that had unwanted sexual experiences reporting some amount of institutional betrayal. Now, researchers can't use words like betrayal. It's those behavioral items. I'm just like we don't use words like assault with students. We describe behavioral scenarios and we say, did this or something like this happen to you? We also found, and I think this is really the important finding, is that this institutional betrayal has a measurable negative impact on the people that experience. What you see here is sexual assault on the x-axis, the horizontal axis. That's the amount of sexual assault somebody experienced. And then you see one of the many symptoms we've looked at, anxiety. And with more sexual assault, on average, you get more anxiety. That's old news. But what's new is that that relationship is exacerbated by the presence of institutional betrayal. And, you know, this is harm added, right? This is institutions adding harm. Institutions don't actually want to do that. So when we saw these results in 2013, I rushed to my university administrators because, after all, we had collected the data at the University of Oregon where we were working, and we weren't set out to study the University of Oregon. We were using, you know, hoping it was representative, which I think it was, but still, it was from the University of Oregon. So I thought, the administrators are going to see this and go, oh my God, we have to fix this. Well, I'm not going to even bother telling you how that went down. <laughs> in, in another study, we um, saw that this, was, this relationship holds for physical symptoms, too. We're looking here at common physical symptoms associated with trauma exposure, and you can see that when we compare people that had these trauma experiences but did or didn't have in, uh, institutional betrayal, too, we have more physical symptoms for those with the, um, the institutional betrayal. Again, I thought, administrators, you're going to want to save money because these students are utilizing health care and that's expensive. Some other researchers figured out how to look at the military population, which is go through the VA, and they compared military sexual trauma survivors with, with or without institutional betrayal and found that institutional betrayal was associated with increased PTSD symptoms, depression, and I think most alarmingly, higher odds of attempting suicide. This is life and death for people. It's also costly for the institutions. It's, you know, people disengage from the system, we've measured that. Um, it leads to illness and absenteeism and turnover, loss of potential talent. I would argue it contributes to a kind of internal rot. Um, and corruption, in some cases, eventual collapse of the institution. I mean, look what's happened with the Boy Scouts. I mean, they survived because of bankruptcy law, but otherwise they would have completely been gone. Um, is there a reputational cost? Well, that depends on the, uh, the larger sort of um, culture, but, uh, but right now there has been a reputational cost when institutional betrayal comes to light. I want to emphasize that the harm of institutional betrayal is operating on at least two levels. One is pragmatic. So when a university doesn't respond well to a sexual assault allegation, this can be um, harmful at the pragmatic level for, for all sorts of people. Um, there can be students who end up flunking out um, because they, they aren't given the right accommodations um, or re-victimized. But there's also this psychological harm that relates to the psychology of betrayal in our attachment system. It hurts people's feelings, and that's very real. You can, as a citizen of your country, you can read about the behavior of your government 
in a way that um, has to do with actions that have no direct bearing on you. They, you know, if kids were moved at the border from their parents. You don't know anybody there. You're not at the border. But you can still experience that pain of betrayal because it's your country doing something that you know is harmful. And just to you know, go back to this, I just um, this snake is to remind me of, um, of something about snakes <laughs> that is sort of metaphoric here. Snakes are um, a cold-blooded reptile. This is a boa constrictor. Um, they don't really have an attachment system, as far as we know. If they do, it's pretty minimal. Um, they're solitary. Um, but they have a behavior of um, hugging. If you pick up a boa constrictor, because you are a warm tree. And when they hug, and I mean, yeah, I know it can sound scary, but a, a boa constrictor can't actually eat you. They're not hugging you to kill you. Um, they're hugging you because you're warm. And you are providing warmth, which is a resource to a cold-blooded animal. But you, the mammal, don't really understand that. You might know it intellectually, but being hugged is a very powerful cue of the attachment system. So. The snake, and I'm a, a bow constrictor lover, hugs me, I feel loved, and I love the snake back. In no way does the bow constrictor actually love me. <laughs> so keep this in mind when you think about institutions. Not to say that they're all snakes, but you can love the institution, and the institution cannot love you back. And I think this is something we need for our literacy. You know, we, we have to work with institutions. Ultimately, it's important that we trust institutions so our society functions, which means we need trustworthy institutions. And it's OK to love them because it's a very human thing to love them. But it's really important to keep in mind it is not a reciprocal relationship. It's not a parent and child. They don't experience love for us. A really brief observation about gender violence on campus from some research that we did at the University of Oregon, and it's just one thing I really want to point out. This was research that was conducted um, campus-wide in 2015. Um, it was what has come to be called a campus climate study. Um, we ran it out of my lab, but it was a campus-wide um, study where we had a random selection of undergraduates and graduate students recruited for our study. And I just want to point out a couple of things. First of all, as you all know, and these results are from the University of Oregon, but they're very similar to other campuses. Um, female undergraduates are at higher risk for sexual assault and related gender violence than males for every category we looked at. And some of these you know, rates are, are alarmingly high. That doesn't mean there's not victimization against males. There is, and if you look at um, harassment, a lot of these students, males and females, are being harassed by peers as well as by faculty and staff. There's a huge amount of it going on. But females are at this higher rate of um, risk. When we look at graduate students, in some ways it's the same pattern, except for one category. Females are statistically more likely to be victimized for everything we looked at. Um, but again, there's you know, too much going on um, for both men and women. But what I really want to do is draw your attention to undergraduates versus graduate students. Now we're just looking at the women. There is one category the graduate students have more of it. Otherwise, undergraduates have more of it. And the reason I want to point this out is I think it speaks to something really important, which is a lot of the problem with this violence has to do with opportunity and power. Undergraduates live with each other. They go to parties together. Graduate students tend not to. That reduces the opportunity and power. This is about external s systems that are increasing the probability of some behavior. And living together, alcohol, parties, fraternities, football games, whatever it is, they all increase the rates that undergraduates are experiencing disproportionately. What's going on with this bottom? So this is graduate students working closely with faculty. And suddenly now we've got the opportunity and the power going on. And furthermore, these graduate students, who do, it's almost 40% who are experiencing, of the female graduate students, some sexual harassment from faculty and staff are paying a price. They're, feel, they're more likely to feel unsafe. They have more trauma symptoms. 
they're more likely to experience additional kinds of institutional betrayal. And I would say sexual harassment by faculty and staff is itself a kind of in overt institutional betrayal. It wasn't how we initially were measuring it, which was more this um, failure to do some things. It's just more overt institutional betrayal. Um, so, you know, it's really problematic. We haven't measured this for staff um, being vulnerable to this kind of treatment, but I think we would see a similar pattern to graduate students. Okay, um, the last um, sort of background topic I want to mention is um, DARVO and disclosure. So we all know that there's a, a problem with silence. People get harmed in these ways and they don't report it. Um, without reporting, it's difficult to stop assault and harassment, yet it's really rare that reporting occurs. Um, just a side note, disclosure and reporting are sometimes referring to somewhat different things. Disclosure perhaps being telling your friend. Reporting often is talked about as more of a formal action, but the words are so intermingled in English. Um, but in any case, what we found was only 6% of the sexually harassed graduate students in that study I was just telling you about reported the harassment to university sources, leaving 94% who did not tell any university source. They might have told a friend, but not anybody official. In a, a similar study with an undergraduate population, Melissa Barnes and I looked at a sample of undergraduates of 512, 189 had experienced sexual victimization on campus, and only 50 had told anyone at all. And if you look at who they told, it was friends, some family members, almost nobody official. They're just not reporting. Why? Well, reporting's super risky. It just is. I mean, out there in the world, it can lead to being prosecuted for false reporting. I mean, it's crazy risky. Um, but, you know, more, that's fortunately not super likely, but it happens. More likely is people get ostracized, they get punished, they get threatened with all sorts of things. In fact, a bad response makes things worse for the victim. Their mental health goes down, their physical health goes down. Pragmatically, things are worse. A good response is great, but the power of a bad response sort of is so great, it, it really overpowers everything. And a bad response from the institution is institutional betrayal. So that's why they don't report. It's just too risky. Why? Um, why don't victims disclose a report? Well, as I said, individuals are not always the best listeners and institutions are not always the best listeners. We can fix this. Harmful responses have been studied. We know what they are, blaming, invalidating, punishing, but also not acknowledging and changing topics, minimizing reassurances, turning the discussion to self, and really importantly, taking away c control from survivor. Mandatory reporting, bad. It's taking control away from the survivor. Control is hugely determinant of how somebody does afterwards. Why? Because sexual assault and sexual harassment are violations of people's autonomy. And the last thing you want to do is hit ahead where it's already been hit again. And that's what happens when you take away people's autonomy. It's really important to find ways to respond to people that respect their control over what happened to them as much as possible. What to do about well-intentioned but unskilled listening? Well, this is, there's some good news here. When people mean well, but they don't have skills, um, they, can, they can inadvertently engage in these problematic behaviors. They can mean well and just not know because they don't get taught. People tend not to get taught how to be good listeners. We can fix this. We should fix it in school. It should be something that children get introduced to. Um, but, you know, they come to college. We can start to work on it there and teach people how to become better listeners. And um, students and I have um, worked on this and studied it and have experimental results and created tip sheets. Tip sheets. <laughs> and um, I want to, um, to encourage you to um, look up um, this if you are interested in specific actions you can take to become a better listener. Next, I want to tell you about a particularly pernicious response, one that I named DARVO now long ago. DARVO is an acronym that stands for Deny, Attack, Reverse, Victim, and Offender. Deny, it never happened. Attacked, you're a liar. Vic reverse, victim, and offender, I'm the real victim. This is a pattern of behavior that um, can occur both at the individual level and at the institutional level. And I would argue institutional DARVO is a form of institutional betrayal. 
Why do people use it? It works. We see it on TV. Um, if the person being accused of um, doing something they shouldn't have responds with very strong denial, angry denial, attacks the credibility of the person making the accusation, and then most perniciously puts themselves in the role of victim and, the per and, and puts the person making the accusation in the role of offender, it works. It's also displayed by powerful figures. It doesn't take long to look around and find celebrities, politicians using DARVO. Um, it's, you know, both sides of the aisle. This is, this is a, a very effective technique. And recently, to my surprise, being, you know, an academic, I found the concept seemed to resonate. Um, in 2017, Ashley Judd started to talk about it. Um, and it started to sort of enter popular discourse. Um, the weirdest moment in my career, I think, and I've had some weird moments, was waking up <laughs> one morning to a bunch of emails saying, Darvo was on the season finale of South Park. And I'm like, what? I'm sort of like, what's South Park? You know? <laughs> um, and I, I, sure enough, you can, it's really funny, it's in 90 seconds, you can Google, Google Darvo and South Park, it's just pretty funny. Um, they, they pretty much got it right, did they give me any credit or any of the proceeds? No. <laughs> um, so what do we know about its, um, its effect? Although I named it in the, in the 1990s, the research is much more um, recent. I have all the Everything I've told you about uh, all the empirical work is on my website. I have PDFs of everything. Um, th there's one page particularly for DARVO that you um, are welcome to view and be able to download all the articles. And also DARVO measures you can use. Um, the DARVO research is really focused on three key areas. Experiencing DARVO, using DARVO, and DARVO's impacts on others. Experiencing DARVO, we have found that 50 to 70 percent of college student targets of sexual assault on campus reported experiencing all three parts of DARVO from someone they confronted. So people are experiencing it a lot, and they don't like it. It, it tends to be a source of distress, as you might imagine. We also found it's a common and harmful package. Um, the parts of DARVO tend to co-occur. It's gendered in that university women compared to men are more likely to be DARVO'd. And when people experience DARVO, it increases victim self-blame and PTSD-like symptoms. So it's not good for their mental health. No matter what happened in the past in the disputed allegation, and often we cannot know, we can observe the behavior right in front of us and we can hold people accountable for what they're doing. Right now, DARVO tends to be quite public most of the time. What do we know about who uses DARVO and what kind of red flags does it raise when someone is using DARVO? I should say right now, if somebody uses DARVO, that's not proof they're guilty. But just like if somebody has lung cancer, it's not proof they smoked, it raises a red flag. DARVO raises a red flag because we have found, and this is, not, this is work that's in the publication pipeline, it has not yet been published past peer review. The other studies I've told you about have. Um, but it has been presented at national conferences. We have found that use of DARVO is associated with some of the antisocial personality variables, narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. Um, it's also associated with false beliefs about wraith myths um, and, and the, act, the act of perpetrating sexual harassment. And I want to say a little more about these last two things. So there are scales called you know, rate myth endorsement where people are asked how much they agree with certain statements that are of some form of, you know, she asked for it by what she was wearing or whatever. Um, people who endorse more rate myths also in our DARVO use measures indicate more times they've used DARVO as a response to an accusation. This is a really giant correlation number for psychology behavior research. Um, these are tightly associated with each other in this correlational study. And um, similarly, I think this is most alarming, people who are telling us through a behavioral measure that they engage themselves in sexual harassment, and I should say this wasn't our measure, this is a measure that has been used rather broadly, 
people are given a bunch of behaviors and say, said, you know, how often do you do this? And they are harassing behaviors, but the word harassment is not used. People who are reporting, self-reporting more harassment behaviors are reporting more DARVO use. A whopping 0.65 correlation here, just kind of stunning. These results do need to be replicated. We've got two samples, though, at this point, a student sample and a MTurk sample that is uh, from around the country. What about its influence on observers? Using a vignette experiment, we found that when participants were exposed to DARVO from an aggressor, the target was relate, rated as less believable, more responsible for the incident, and more abusive. So people get a vignette about an interpersonal violation. The person accused either uses DARVO or doesn't use DARVO. When they use DARVO, it leads to this perception of the, um, the target as less believable, et cetera. At the same time, the aggressor was rated as less responsible, less abusive but interestingly less believable too. There's a little hit for using DARVO, and that's intuitive to me. It is a little swarmy. Um, it's just that it works, it's reputational damage more on the person who's the target of it. And this is a key point. DARVO by the aggressor in this, this research affects how willing others are to punish both the target and the aggressor. DARVO makes others less willing to punish the aggressor. 20% decrease in willingness to punish and more willing to punish the target, a 30% increase in willingness to punish. And think about those people who get prosecuted for making a rape charge. They're being punished, right? <coughs> Summary, DARVO's impact on the, um, DARVO by the aggressor influence how observers think and feel about both targets and aggressors. Overall, DARVO from the aggressor increased negative thoughts and feelings about tar targets and also decreased negative thoughts and feelings about aggressors. And importantly, it affects how much others believe the aggressor and the target should be disciplined for their behavior. Is there something we can do about this? Is there an anti-DARVO form of education? Um, fortunately, we have some indication that yes, simply teaching people about DARVO seems to reduce its impact. People are pattern recognizers, right? They, they have a concept, they see it, they're able to say, oh, I know what that is. And then it's just not as effective. Also, I want to point out, because people often say, well, wait a minute, what if I'm falsely accused? Aren't I going to respond with DARVO? No, not necessarily at all. One does not have to respond to an accusation that they believe is false with DARVO. One can say, oh, you know, I, I'm shocked. I didn't remember it that way. I, I don't know why you're saying this. I'm quite confused. It's not how I understood what happened. Um, but, you know, I want to understand what's leading you to say this. And, um, you know, they can say a bunch of things without attacking the credibility of the person making the accusation and, importantly, without putting themselves in the victim role. Think about the impact this will have on everybody who's watching what's going on. Like on those national scenes. Are they going to be silent when something's happened to them or are they going to feel safe in talking about what's happening to them? So a question for future research is, can we teach people how to avoid using DARVO and how to use more constructive responses? Um, just to go back to this point, we, some things we can't know about. Often we can't know what happened in the past, but we can hold people accountable for their behavior right now. So now the last section, institutional courage. Can we repair and prevent institutional betrayal and institutional DARVO? And here's where the concept of institutional courage comes in. This is a working definition. Um, it's an institution's commitment to seek the truth and engage in moral action despite unpleasantness, risk, and short-term cost. It's a pledge to protect and care for those who depend on the institution. It's a compass oriented to the common good of individuals, institutions, and the world. And it's a force that transforms institutions into more accountable, equitable, healthy places for everyone. In detail, what does that look like? I've identified 11 steps. I'm going to go, um, let me check the time. Yeah, I have time. I'm going to go through each step briefly, so I'm not going to read 
um, this list, but I just want to say this is not like the exhaustive list. It's just the steps I've identified. Um, but I have confidence in each of these steps based on either research or um, actually having seen it play out in institutional contexts. And I, I just want to add, too, I, I didn't make a slide about this, but probably I should. But one of the ways I sometimes think about institutional courage is analogous to, um, well, you know, some of the problems in society are really hard to fix. You know, global warming is really hard to figure out. I would say abuse in the family is really hard to figure out. That's a tough one. I don't think institutional betrayal is that hard to figure out. I think we, we can measure it. Um, institutions have resources. They're contained units. It can be fixed. We just haven't known to do it, and we haven't really realized it's so important. And that the analogy I sometimes think about is sanitation, because there was a time in history when people did not have a germ theory. They didn't understand the power of basic sanitation and keeping people alive. They did things because they were ignorant. They didn't know. They didn't wash their hands. They used dirty needles. Whatever it was, they threw trash out the window. Like, people didn't know. And some people do that anyway, when, even when they know. But there are vast numbers of people that when they know something is harmful, they stop doing it. And I think a lot of institutional betrayals like that. We, we just need to educate people. And maybe that's, you know, I'm an educator, Pollyanna. But I actually really do believe it. I think some amount of this is just give people the concepts and the tools and then can start to improve the behavior of institutions. So what are those behaviors? Well, this is um, sort of a two-part thing. On the one hand, it's really important that institutions obey civil rights laws. We actually have some good laws in the United States. We've got Title IX. We've got Title VII. It is alarming how much noncompliance there is to civil rights laws. And um, how little enforcement there is. So a great first step is to comply with our good civil rights laws. But here's the other part of that. It is really dangerous to get into a compliance mindset because that quickly turns into check the box. And then actions are taken that check the box but don't actually get to the spirit or heart. People are really good at gaming systems. They'll figure out how to check the box and not comply really. So it's really important to be on guard. And part of that is to beware a risk mindset. And universities have really fallen prey to this risk management mindset. I would argue part of the problem is giving general counsel offices. I don't know if anyone's here from general counsel. General counsels are important. We need them. But giving them the role of setting policy for universities um, is really going to make a risk management mindset dominate. When university presidents don't decide what's the right thing to do based on morality and excellence and turn it over to a lawyer, they're going to go with what they've learned to do, which is reduce the risk in the moment. And um, we, of course, want to reduce risk, but the risk management mindset is very short term. It's reduce, reduce the risk right now, and then it sets people up for this danger. Two. Educate the institutional community. This gets back to this ignorance problem. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people in vast high power who do not understand the most basic things about victim psychology. They think people you know, get sexually assaulted and they're going to scream it out on the rooftop and run to the police station and everything's going to just be fine. And if they don't, something's wrong with them or it's not true. It's like. Really? I mean, how many decades have we known about victim psychology and they don't know that? It doesn't get taught. They don't know it. And it's, you know, society resists that information. Now they also don't know all about all the ways they commit institutional betrayal. This can be changed through education. It, it, and today's event, you know, it's great. This is some education, but we need a whole lot more than, you know, these sorts of one-off lectures. Um, I w want to mention again that at Michigan, there's a lot of scholarship right here to draw on. A lot of what is known has been discovered here at the University of Michigan. Three, add checks and balances to power structure and diffuse highly dependent relationships. You know, the whole logic of betrayal depends on asymmetry, where a person who you're depending on can betray you by not giving you what they, they um, should be giving you. The more asymmetry and power you have, 
the higher the rates, uh, the, the sort of vulnerability to betrayal. And we set up hierarchical systems in society. Um, as far as I know, we, we just do that all the time. And I'm not saying we should get rid of all hierarchies because that may not be plausible. But we can diffuse them. We can put in checks and balances. For instance, in graduate education, um, when one advisor controls everything for a student, that's a setup for um, betrayal. betrayal. You can have committees that are empowered to meet with a student without the advisor in the room, all sorts of things that you can just structurally do to diffuse that kind of um, situation. Four, respond well to victim disclosures and create a trauma-informed reporting policy. This is so important because if people don't talk about things, it's really hard to address them, as we've talked about. Um, and people can be educated to be good listeners. There can be policies that respect survivors' autonomy. And also there can be um, institutional mechanisms for identifying and responding to DARVO attacks. Bear witness, be accountable, and apologize. There is so much good that can come from sincere accountability and especially sincere apologies. Um, I will give you an example of one that, that went well in, in the end. Um, but I do want to add that insincere apologies can actually do additional harm. People are sensitive to the sincerity of an apology. Um, so it doesn't work to just pretend. Create a culture of truth telling and cherish the whistleblowers. People always say to me, well, what are we going to do about the problem of retaliation? If somebody does bring something to light, they're going to get punished. Yes, retaliation is really hard to stop. There are rules against retaliation, but it happens anyway. And some of the way retaliation happens, you really even can't have a rule against, because it's like the person doesn't meet your eyes. They don't invite you to lunch. Like, you can't have a rule against that. People can get very retaliated through ostracism that's very hard to legislate. Um, we know from decades, if not centuries, of research in psychology that trying to change behavior through punishment is really hard. The way we change behavior is through reward. Let's not focus on stopping retaliation. I mean, sure, we want to stop it when we see it. But let's focus on rewarding the behavior we want, which is people coming forward and telling the truth about what happened to them. The software industry pays people to find bugs in programs. We can institute ways of rewarding people for coming forward. And fortunately, for people who dare to tell their institution about what they've observed, they tend to be rewarded by the most simple thing, which is appreciation. When they're sincerely thanked for coming forward, that's the reward. And it's doubled when the institution makes a change based on that information. So I don't mean give people money. I mean give people respect and acknowledgement for being truth tellers. That's the way to change the culture, I strongly believe. Seven, conduct scientifically sound anonymous surveys. You know, now universities are sort of on board with this and do the climate s surveys that just, you know, that's relatively new. They're doing them, sometimes they're not done very well. But not all stakeholders tend to get surveyed very well. Um, if you don't know what's really going on for a stigmatized issue, it's going to be really hard to fix it and address it. And many, although universities have kind of come on board with this, most of, our, of the institutions in our society don't do anything like this. It is imp very important for survey research that it be done scientifically well um, and that people have true um, sense of being anonymous so they can <coughs> tell the truth. A lot of people think, oh, surveys, that's easy. I just go and ask somebody, were you raped? And, did, you, did it make you feel bad? <laughs> That's not the way to do it. But we have the tools um, well developed at this point. Eight, engage in self-study. This Any large organization should be creating self-study groups responsible for asking on a regular basis, are you making it easier or difficult for people to report experiences? Are you respecting individuals' autonomy? And so on. And to include representation from all stakeholders. It's also important to ask if the incentive structures are aligned with the goal to reduce institutional betrayal. Are you incentivizing people to betray? Because guess what? Then you're going to have more of it. So look at closely at incentive structures. Nine, be transparent. Sexual violence, betrayal, and corruption all thrive in secrecy. And while privacy for individuals is really important to respect, I can't tell you how much um, I have seen information buried that should be public. Um, policies, rates of victimization, and so on tend to be 
so buried in institutional websites, either by design or not, but um, this should be made very, very transparent. 10, use the power of your institution to address the societal problems. This is a no-brainer for research universities. Research the issue, teach about it, but even institutions that are not research universities often have the ability to use their institution and their resources to address the problem, not just in their backyard, but in the wider society. The film industry can make documentaries that instead of objectifying women and glorifying violence, you know, present the truth about these things and so on. 11, commit resources. None of these things are free. None of them are that expensive, actually, but none of them are free. So it's important to actually have some budget for these steps. So that's what, you know, I've, I've identified. As I said, there could be so much more added to this list. But I, I would stand by these steps. These are very likely to help move things in the right direction. We've done some research. What's new research? Um, it was published earlier this year, our first study. We've, done, done, we've created a new measure. All these measures I've talked about are on my website and for free. Um, in this first study, there were 800 employees around the country in various industries. And we found that institutional courage um, buffers against sexual violence and institutional betrayal for employees. I found it poignant because even people who were really harmed, if there was some institutional courage or enough of it, tended to look like the people who hadn't been harmed in the first place. It didn't take a whole lot to buffer. Um, and I, the poignancy is I think people really want to trust their institutions. They feel much better when they can trust their institutions. It, it you know, puts things into alignment. We have a similar set of results for students that research is under review. I also want to say a new resource that's on the website for the Center for Institutional Courage. Um, it's a brand new resource. We've been tracking research on institutional betrayal and courage, and we've identified now 180 publications that are, um, in one way or another, grappling with these concepts and trying to measure these things. Um, and in this graphic, we um, organized the research based on the kind of institution people were focused on, and then the kind of harm that was sort of underlying the institutional response. And not surprisingly, most of, you know, the, the largest um, percentage of the research is sexual violence in educational institutions, because that's where the research started. But you'll see there's a lot being done in other domains, too. 38 publications in healthcare, for instance, often looking at non-sexual sorts of harm that are leading to institutional betrayal. But then there's some big holes, lots of holes that need to be filled. Okay. Um, last but not least, a case study. What does institutional courage look like in practice? I've been collecting as much as I can examples. Um, in this particular case, um, we see institutional, one kind of institutional courage. And this case connects to um, something that happened initially in 1998. Brenda Tracy um, was at um, I was living in Corvallis, Oregon, um, which is where Oregon State University is. Just to clarify, for most of my career, I was at the University of Oregon. That's in Eugene, Oregon. This is 45 minutes away. They are both bucolic, you know, Division I research universities. They just are different. So Oregon State University. And there was a party, and Brenda Tracy reported that she was um, gang raped and that two of the accused assailants were OSU football players. Prosecutors, and she did report, prosecutors led her to believe the case was weaker than it was, her rape kit was destroyed, the two football players had one game suspension in community service, and no one from OSU talked to Tracy. 16 years forward, 2014, suddenly the topic of campus sexual assaults everywhere. It's on every magazine cover at least once alumni magazines, popular magazines. It was on the front page of the New York Times. Everybody's suddenly talking about it. And Brenda Tracy, who's lived 16 years with this situation, and done the best she could. She got a nursing degree. She raised two kids. But she was suffering. A terrible thing happened to her, really terrible. She sees this, and she's like, hey, what happened to me? I recognize this. So she got up the nerve to call OSU and um, asked them, what had happened, and at first, whoever she called was evasive. Oh, that's so long ago, we don't know. Um, but she also had the opportunity to talk to a sports columnist, very beloved in Oregon, 
um, named Cusano, and he wrote a column about the case in the primary paper for Portland and the state called the Oregonian. Um, he wrote a column about the case, and you can imagine the president of OSU, who was a different president by then, his email, you know, blowing up with copies of this um, column. And then what's the typical president of a university to do when his email's blowing up for some scandal? Circle the wagons, call in the crisis team, deny, deny, deny. But that's not what this president did. He read the column and immediately ordered an investigation. And he said, do it fast. Three weeks later, he met with Brenda Tracy and shared the results of the investigation. Not only that, he wrote her a letter on letterhead in which he apologized for past institutional betrayal. He wrote, Dear Brenda, Oregon state officials are very grateful that you took time to meet with us. We are so sorry for what you experienced in 1998 and have lived with since. What we have learned recently of your suffering is heartbreaking and your bravery inspires us. We are also grateful for you for raising the public dialogue about the consequences of sexual violence in our society and for raising a discussion of how society can better assist survivors of such violence. While we cannot undo this nightmare, we apologize to you for any failure on Oregon State University's part to better assist you in 1998. That sentence has lawyers all over it, obviously. But you know what? The lawyers probably told them not to write it at all. And he wrote a sentence that went out and it worked in that he meant it sincerely. He was sincerely apologizing. Brenda Tracy read it, and I've interviewed both of them. She read it as sincere. It worked. It was real. From the apology letter continued, as promised a few weeks ago, we conducted an exhaustive review of the facts of how OSU handled this matter 16 years ago. This review was completed this past Friday, and we want to share the results of that review with you. He didn't stop there. After that, he hired Brenda Tracy to be his consultant to address improved institutional response, and she worked for him for two years. That led to many important innovations and changes at OSU. So here's one way institutional courage actually looks. It involves investigation and transparency. It involves acknowledgement and apology. Importantly, it involves cherishing the whistleblower. What's the best way? You ask them to help you fix the situation. He really cherished her. And that then led to increasing resources and awareness in campus. Not only that, they did reach beyond their own campus. They went and they um, lobbied state legislators and got some legislation passed to address the problem at a state level. And this went on for quite a while. Um, unfortunately, Ed Ray retired. OSU hired another president. Um, now they're on yet another president because the one that they hired really messed up in exactly this space. Um, so, I mean, another part of this story is it was great for a while, but it's not like a thing you're done with. You have to keep doing it. So, institutional courage is possible, and, uh, you know, one of the ways I described a, a leader using it, um, another way it can happen is grassroots, when you've got solidarity and enough people working on it. Um, it's needed. It does work. Um, but it is still relatively rare. I do believe we can change that. Um, and I want to thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much uh, for that. So you'll be taking some questions. Well, I, I was going to ask you if um, you wanted me to do that now or wait till after the panel. And Yeah, I don't know. How would you like to handle it? Start. We have a few minutes if we want to take a few questions yeah, okay. now. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to make a remark, actually, uh, because I work with denial. <laughs> which I gather is similar to betrayal. Mm -hmm. And when I was uh, working with that, there is a cognitive sociologist called Eviatar Zerubabel, mm -hmm. and he's written a very interesting book on the elephant in the room. Yeah. What happens when we don't truth tell? And he says that people's uh, trust in humanity basically disappears because for the victims, 
there is no humanity yeah. uh, because they haven't uh, been you know, rewarded yeah. accordingly. And for the perpetrators, there is also no need for a humanity because with violence they've been able to solve their problems. So as a consequence, he argues it leads to the, de uh, the decline of the moral fabric of society yeah. and basically to authoritarianism and all that, yeah. which is similar to what you're t talking yeah. about. No, no that, I'm really glad you brought that up. And you know, I think that there are lots of different motivations behind people's denial. Um, and we often get a kind of what might be called a perfect storm, where some people's motivations are kind of pretty badly intended. They are covering up their own crimes or seeking power. Um, but then there can be the people with the betrayal blindness who don't have bad intentions. They're trying to hold on, desperately hold on to the little bit they have and not rock the boat. But those two things can collude for a really massive denial in society. And I think we still see this around sexual violence, where obviously perpetrators of sexual violence, and there are a lot of them, have a motivation to suppress all sorts of things that would, would address sexual violence. There's an even larger number of people who are not motivated as perpetrators, but still are colluding in this suppression um, because it's very threatening for them for other reasons um, in terms of rocking the boat. And I think we see this all on happening. And so trying to figure out how to break that denial, I think requires analyzing it and, and understanding it comes from these different forces. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, that's a tremendous talk. Um, I was in interested in one of your 11 recommendations around not letting a risk management um, approach guide your decision making. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, our Title IX office is like lawyers all the way down and they work very closely with OGC. I'm curious <laughs> if there are any schools where that is not the case and what in your opinion would be a structural, like what structures imagined outside of that mold would promote different ways of thinking beyond risk management? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, um, you know, some of my best friends in the world are lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, they, I don't think that in general there, there are certain positions that should not go to lawyers, um, but lawyers do have an important role to play, an important job. Um, I would say that we have had a very unfortunate thing happen in the United States with the, um, the, the way Title IX has become part of the central bureaucracy. Because, you know, back in the olden days, um, there was really no Title IX to speak of. Even if it was required, it just wasn't happening. And um, people who were sexually assaulted on campus didn't have anywhere to go with the central administration or the structure of the university, they would go, if they went to anyone, they would go to either off-campus rape crisis centers or they would go to the women's center on campus, which I understand might have been in this very building. And women's centers might have been funded by the administration, but the administration was paying no attention to what they were doing. They'd be given some little paltry amount of money to run. And then they went off and did their, their thing. And they were incredible advocates for victims of sexual assault and met many of their psychological needs. When Title IX became part of the central bureaucracy, which happened, I think, initially for good reasons and intentions, um, this was partly you know, a function of the Obama administration and trying to get universities to take responsibility, but they became, they lawyered up. And um, the Title IX, there's an implicit conflict of interest because they're being paid by the university and they're not being, not like a women's center that no one's paying attention. They're really being paid attention to. Often they're reporting to general counsel and then their paycheck's coming from the university who may be the betrayer. Uh, that just creates an obvious, that's where you look, you look at your incentive structure. Um, so. I think that you know some universities have done a better job in protecting their Title IX offices. One way is to not have reporting, to have reporting in Title IX go straight to the president. That helps a little bit. Um, having, hiring somebody who has a good background in victim advocacy can help. But I've talked to a lot of Title IX administrators and there's some wonderful ones out there. But unfortunately what I have seen, a pattern I have seen is that 
Title IX administrators often do start with a real ideological pro-victim stance, let's fix the system. And then they get into the system and they either get their soul murdered or they drink the Kool-Aid. And the ones who are left, not all of them, but it, it's selecting for people who are willing to, to go along with the bureaucracy and the incentive structure. And yeah, I think we need a structural change. I don't think it's ultimately gonna work. Title IX doesn't ultimately work to be implemented. It really probably we need, I don't know, some external third party, a federal agency, maybe the Department of Education, if we could have good yeah. people in charge of that. Yeah. That was, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know, but I, I think you're right. And it, it's unfortunate that the very system designed to supposedly fix the problem then ends up covering it and contributing to it. Hello, um, I have two questions if that's okay. Um, the first one was about um, the survey at Oregon um, that specifically asked like, have you experienced dating violence or stalking or sexual violence? And I'm curious if you think that that survey encapsulates those who are actively experiencing betrayal blindness mm -hmm. or if they're in that other category of like perhaps people who have not come to terms with what they've That's experienced. That's such a great question. Like how do you study something people don't know. So part of the answer to that is that we use really behaviorally specific questions. Those same people, I didn't present this data, but you know, typically we run these studies, we ask them these very behavioral questions, and all the way at the end we ask them, were you raped? Were you sexually assaulted? Were you? And they'll say no. So they describe, they check a box like, yeah, this person, you know, against my will, inserted something into this body part of mine. No, I wasn't raped. Like, they don't apply that label. That's probably a bu bunch of things, um, but one of them may be a certain amount of be betrayal blindness. However, betrayal blindness can be so powerful that they can't even recognize the event happened. When then we're just gonna miss those cases. We're not gonna get them. Yeah. That's fascinating, thank you. Um, the second question for Context, I'm from Eugene and I went to the University of Oregon. Oh, okay. So, Were you in my um, study? <laughs> I, no, I don't think so. I just missed it. Um, but I am curious about, you know, these programs that institutions provide. So at UO, they have prevention programs for first years and they have self-defense classes that are supposed to be focused on empowerment. Um, and I'm curious if, like, you have thoughts on what the, like, use of those programs are and maybe how we can use like our understandings of institutional betrayal and courage to actually um, maybe change some of the mechanisms of those programs. That's such a great question. Yeah, I mean, those, those programs get a lot of bad rap and um, I would say the devil's in the details. Um, a lot of those programs really deserve the bad rap because they're terrible. But that doesn't mean you couldn't have good ones. Um, part of the problem with the prevention programs that um, often are implemented is there's just way too little and it's Mickey Mouse. You know, people are going to watch some video for two hours that tells them not to rape or whatever. It's like, no, that's not obviously going to do any good. I mean, faculty still around the country, I believe, are still taking these little survey, little, it's like driver, like, driver ed sort of things. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't have good education. Similarly with um, self-defense, there are some really thoughtful self-defense programs that have been studied empirically that look like they are really making a positive difference. And it's occurring not because, I mean, people, one objection to self-defense is you're putting the onus on the victim when the problem should be putting the responsibility on the would-be perpetrator. And sure, but if you can um, teach people um, empowerment of the form that actually prevents, helps prevent the assault in the first place, that's pretty powerful. Um, and, it, and some of these programs, the data suggests that, uh, that exactly that um, can occur. And um, it may be that the empowerment helps shift the culture in a way that perpetrators are getting educated. I'd still like to see us figure out better prevention programs that do directly work with would-be perpetrators. Thank you. And we are taking the last question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate your research about institutional betrayal and betrayal trauma, which 
really resonates with a lot of experiences here. Um, but when I look at this list of recommendations, I feel a sense of futility because so many of them require the institution to change. And I think about, for example, like a compliance office, which we've just apparently are we're about to have a new compliance office here at the University of Michigan, which the faculty pushed for. And as I've seen it kind of play out, many of the recommendations faculty met, made are not being implemented in the new office. And it starts to seem something that's just absorbed into the institution and is going to be another sort of problematic um, office, sort of like ECRT is and the Title IX office. You know, or I think about, like you mentioned, needing better listening. But um, my experience going to the Title IX office and many people that I've heard from is that the investigator sits down with you and actually listens very carefully in a very like emotionally caring way and then sends you a report that's filled with inaccuracies or um, intentionally undermines what you've said by making it seem like more emotional than it was and so on. So I've just seen so many of these strategies you talk about be kind of co-opted by the institution in really in ways that do not help the situation. Um, so an attorney that I talked with about um, institutional betrayal um, told me that her opinion is that the only way institutions change is through um, public shaming, essentially through like legal cases and through um, like a story in the press. And it's interesting that in your case study, there's this it really like happened in some ways because there was a story in the press that was public. And I'm wondering like why in your list of recommendations, those sorts of like public actions is not part of that list. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And the list was really written for what institutions can do. Um, but you're right. I mean, individuals um, can certainly help instigate um, a um, pressure on the institution that comes from the outside in some sense. So I have to agree that, um, you know, often institutional change is, is, is inspired by um, by press in one way or another. And even lawsuits don't do it. It has to be a lawsuit that gets the attention of the press. Because institutions don't care about lawsuits that much. They've got insurance or money, they'll just pay you off. Uh, what they do care about, indeed, is the bad publicity. And, um, and that really can make a difference. But just having the bad publicity without a plan for change, isn't the, and then the institution's not gonna really know what to do other than try to get through the situation. You know, I don't know, sometimes I feel the despair that you're describing. You know, can these things really change? Um, but, but I, you know, and I think maybe it's just, it's a little bit too early to know because if you look at any social movement and any culture change that liberates people, it takes a while and it's bumpy. And you know, even the sanitation thing took, and that wasn't even like a, a an oppression thing, it was just like, knowledge to change risk, but it takes a while and people have false steps. And so I'm holding out hope that, that some of these things will um, be doable enough that institutions will grab onto them. Um, and although I said institutions can't love you back and I talk about institutions almost as if they're a thing, they're obviously only sort of a thing, they're a constellation of people but they have emergent properties and enduring characteristics too. Um, when you've got enough individuals who are people, or even a small number of people with enough power in the institution that do see the light, they really can start to make those changes. So I think we just can't give up. Like we just have to keep trying and hope that the world does get better. But I don't think there's any guarantee. I just, you know, I just look back at the, changes that have occurred in my lifetime. I think about what it was like when I was a graduate student and um, sexual harassment was so rampant. I was like, there was only one or two faculty members who did not harass those of us graduate students. And I, you know, there's still a lot of sexual harassment, but I look at the experience my students have, my graduate students versus what I had, and it has gotten better. It's, it's, so, you know, from that, that's 40 years or whatever. I take hope from that. On that wonderful note, uh, we, add, we finalize the Q 
Yes, um, for those of you watching from home, um, we're going to take a brief intermission uh, while we set up the panel, and we'll be back in uh, maybe five minutes or so for that. Thank you. Getting better? You mind checking again? It's getting better, right? All right, hopefully a last check. You mind saying something? All right, how does it sound? Oh, that's much better. Okay, we're, we're doing good there. 
How are you doing today?
And nope. Oh, there, there's, that's the first There's the Yes, we are about to start. Nicole, I've got the, should I turn this microphone Thank off from you. you on my computer? Is this affecting you and your audio? Uh, audio sounds fine, actually. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are now go moving on to the, the panel discussion. Uh, and uh, what the way we're going to be doing it is that since uh, Jennifer said that, you know, uh, she has uh, delivered uh, um, the talk, she's very interested in uh, the reactions uh, that our two panelists have, as well as you, uh, to, the, uh, to the talk that uh, she gave. Uh, and before that, uh, I wanted to uh, read to you uh, our two panelists' bios. Uh, uh, Nicole Buchanan, Buchanan PhD, to my left, is a professor at Michigan State University. She inter researches the interplay of race, gender, and victimization, and how they impact the nature of harassment, its impact, and organizational best practices. I have a feeling it's even more pessimistic and terrible for you than <laughs> when you only have one. Uh, intersectionality kills you, doesn't it? She also studies faculty of color and ways in which their research is marginalized, that is, epistemic exclusion. She has been highlighted in hundreds of media outlets, is a featured speaker, including TEDx and National Public Radio, and provides bias and diversity-related training and consultation. For example, medical professionals, faculty, clinicians, human resource managers, and police departments. Dr. Buchanan is a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science, four divisions of the American Psychological Association, Society of Clinical Psychology, Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues, Society for the Psychological Study of Ethnic Minority Issues, and Society for the Psychology of Women. And she has received national and international awards for her research, teaching, and professional service. And uh, we have, in addition to Nicole Buchanan, on uh, Zoom, uh, Nicole Bedera, uh, uh, PhD, and I'm very happy to say that uh, I was her dissertation advisor uh, uh, here uh, at the University of Michigan. So I even know the, the university, what it was and all that, but I won't tell. Uh, she's a sociologist, she's amazing and author of, of the forthcoming book, On the Wrong Side, colon, How Universities Betray Survivors to Protect Perpetrators of Sexual Assault. Her scholarship has influenced sexual violence prevention programming across the United States, and her work has been featured in many popular outlets, including the New York Times, NPR, and Teen Vogue. To put her research into action, Nicole is also affiliate, an affiliated educator with the Center for Institutional Courage and a co-founder for Beyond Compliance Consulting. If you get Nicole on something, woof, she'll take it through and the pessimism about social change, she's one that will overcome it, I'm certain. She gives me hope about the future. And on that note, uh, let me just ask uh, uh, both of you, um, your reactions uh, and comments uh, regarding uh, Jennifer's uh, speech. Who do you want? Who wants to go first? Would you like to go first? The other Nicole? Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, first of all, I thought it was a fantastic, fantastic talk, and I'm so excited to kind of be here virtually. And one of my reactions was thinking about the role of gender bias in how that shapes institutional betrayal. In my scholarship, I was really interested in the guiding ideologies of administrators in these cases and the way they were shaped by the institution. 
And one of the things that I found was there's this public perception that the reason that institutional betrayal happens is because there's this distrust of survivors or this, this disdain for survivors. And I thought it was quite the opposite, that administrators were more interested in protecting perpetrators because they just thought it was unfair or they were uncomfortable with the types of ramifications that they pictured some kind of consequences would have on their lives. And this really gets into this philosophical concept of empathy, where we give more empathy in our society than men than to women. And so when administrators had to make these decisions, they sort of default empathized with perpetrators who were overwhelmingly men. And part of the support for this finding was that when gender roles were reversed, and it was women who were in the role of respondent, they did not get the same kind of protective benefits. And so that's something I think we should be thinking about in changing policy and also in our conversations today is the way gender bias is also present in these institutional proceedings and that connection between institutional change and cultural shift as well. And Nicole, I'm excited to hear from you too. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, uh, absolutely. Every time I hear Jennifer talk, I mean, this, it's, this was just another example of a series of incredible work and incredible talks um, that really I find invigorating rather than demoralizing, perhaps because you end with institutional courage. Um, and I, <laughs> I caught the snicker as people heard I'm from MSU who is yet embroiled in yet another sexual scandal among one of at least three scandals that are ongoing at the moment. Um, and, and it is demoralizing, <laughs> and the institutional betrayals have been just racking up, um, you know, for well over a decade. I was part of the 2024, uh, 2014 task force looking at uh, kind of doing a 360 on campus and looking at sexual assault on campus, and we created, you know, a 30 pages of recommendations for the university that was quickly buried, and um, months later the Nassar case broke. So the idea that we were doing this work while the institution was hiding the Nasser case, um, you know, was really um, intense. So the, the idea of institutional betrayal and, and what that looks like and how it can be overcome has been near and dear to my heart. What is clear to me is also that it really requires that the institution has the will to do it differently. And one of my concerns that your talk also highlighted for me was, and how fragile those changes can be, um, and that you have a change of leadership and you may have um, all of the work for a decade dismantled. And, um, and, and I've been seeing this over and over again in a variety of institutions where um, you may have that, and, and I'm a big, big um, advocate for getting leadership on board and for reminding leadership that they set the tone and they will be responsible for what happens and whether or not change occurs. But we also need to do a little bit more, well, no, a lot a bit more, and also getting those changes instituted in ways that can't be unraveled as soon as we have a change in leadership. And so um, hearing your example of so many good things done, and then the president changes, and that next pre president almost seems to be a reaction per perhaps to that good work, and we've seen this at a national level as well, where there is a, a reactionary leader that comes in and not only undoes the work, but can really set the tone in a dramatically different direction. And so thinking about how do we not only create this institutional courage that is there in the moment, but that becomes regimented in ways that it cannot be so easily undone. Um, and perhaps, although leadership sets the tone and they create the impetus for that change, uh, doing more to spread those values throughout the organization so that if there is a change of leadership that tries to unravel them, it becomes much more difficult to do that because there's been this wide buy-in. And so perhaps that's a piece of where that next step needs to, needs to be happening. Um, I think oftentimes we get excited about the changes that are happening, but if they can be unraveled, then it didn't go deep enough. It didn't go far enough in the work. Um, and also, I was really fascinated in thinking so much about the discussion about where have our Title IX offices uh, become housed and what does that look like and thinking about um, not only the gender bias but as I think about what's happened in some recent, case, recent cases that I'm privy to, um, one seeing how the support and the value for 
the 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 victim in this case, or the survivor in this case, and seeing how once the perpetrator filed suit against the university, everything flipped. And the support and the concern and the, even the, the, if you track the emails and look at the responses, the, the hostility and the switch in those responses changed almost at the moment that the perpetrator filed suit against the institution. And then the outcomes and everything fell in line with, with with protecting the institution at that point. And so really resonating with this idea of um, we need a new system, and we need a system that is taking it um, so it's no longer a direct benefit to the institution to hide these cases or to protect themselves. And, um, but also thinking as we, as I always do, complicate the, the question um, and looking at the gender biases we see, uh, the, one of the cases in particular that I'm hearkening to, there's also racial biases. Uh, there were biases related to country of origin and somebody who was um, a naturalized citizen here. And um, also language and, and being able to weaponize either a misuse of a word or a word that perhaps has a different connotation and the translation didn't quite take, the um, unwillingness to spend the time to translate documents and to have that done professionally and all these things that are embedded in how these systems work that are um, layering on additional harms, additional betrayals, and really highlighting the, the fact that we devalue certain members of our community and their the way that they are being devalued it falls along gendered lines racial lines uh, country of origin and language barriers so how do we kind of complicate these pictures to really encompass those that are the most vulnerable among us and make sure that their needs are being served and then as a result all of our boats are lifted wonderful comments um, if i may add a sociological you know, uh, analysis to it. On the one hand, you have an institution. An institution, as you know, is extremely complex, got, houses thousands of people, mostly, you know, uh, and what are prominent in institutions are, even though us faculty are supposed to be self-governing, it's the administrators. And I think what happens is that administrators, as they move away from teaching and research, uh, become experts of kinds that no longer uh, connect to the rest of the faculty uh, as such. So there's a certain amount of alienation that comes from holding a position of power over the rest. And, and on the one side you have the institution, on the other you have individuals, be they undergraduates, graduate students, faculty, staff. We deal with them as individuals. You cannot have, an ins you cannot have individuals take on an institution you have to have a community. So we cannot, as faculty, if we're treated alone as individuals, be able to do anything. For a social movement to happen, we have to be able to be mobilized. Uh, as a, because only then will we have enough social power to take on the administration and the institution. It's at least what I've learned. Not that I've been able to carry it out, but at least that's what social change in teacher tells us. So, Nicole, do you want to add anything more, or shall we turn to Jennifer? Yes, go ahead. There was one thing that came up for me when listening to Nicole speaking, and that was thinking about how our definition of violence, something we encounter a lot in this work, is people reacting and saying, wow, I can't believe that you're considering something like sexual harassment to be violence. When we know as researchers that sexual harassment, specifically within an organizational context, can create the same kind of problems in that context, in that type of institutional betrayal, as rape or other types of violence that more people are likely to see as serious. And listening to Nicole's comments, one of the things that came up to me that I haven't published anywhere quite yet, I do have a book coming out very soon, but that was really apparent in talking to women of color who were experiencing institutional betrayal was that our definitions of violence are not nearly broad enough. And that often their experiences of sexual harassment were not covered in any institutional policy. And I'll give you a really crystal clear example of this. All of the black women in my study, which was an ethnography, the sample size is relatively small, but all of the ones who experienced sexual harassment at their university, it started from either a peer or a superior 
trying to claim credit for work that they did not do, trying to claim credit for work and expecting black women to work for them without compensation or recognition. And if they refuse to do that, that is what escalated into forms of sexual harassment the institution might recognize. And so I think as part of this work too, and thinking to the future, thinking about where those root causes of this type of violence comes from, and it often does come from other forces of inequality, of power disparities, and that they're also tightly interwoven, even though on college campuses in particular, we tend to break up those processes and say, this one goes to Title IX, this one goes to total, Title VII, when really they can't be separated, and that creates additional barriers for the survivors who are now going through many, many de different proceedings where their experiences aren't recognized in any of them. It's not just something that came up for me that I wanted to flag as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, is this on? Okay. Um, your comments both are just like, my mind is racing with ideas. Thank you so much. Um, just um, on the, the last topic, one of the things that, you know, I mentioned I was so naive in 2013 when I had the data on institutional betrayal and the harm it was causing, and I took it to the university administration and thought that they would be like, oh, thank you for letting us know we're going to fix this. And that wasn't the response I got. And um, in fact, I got a really defensive response, and I, I you know, was not expecting that. I was just so naive because any, well, then, you know, now I think anything that's really entrenched is serving some purpose in maintaining the status quo. And so there's going to be resistance to changing the status quo because then people who have power, think they have power, think they will get power, don't want to lose that power. So I think when we think about changing these systems, you know, one of the, the difficult but important things to think about is how to confront that, whether it's to call it out and be explicit about it, um, or whether it's to find other ways to um, show people that they're actually, in making a change, not making their situation worse. Um, you know, and that, that's part of like the, the difficulty is figuring out how to get around that um, that responsiveness. And in terms of like the the underlying role, I'm so glad you talked about this. The, the Nicole on the screen <laughs> about you know the underlying root causes and the gender violence, and then Nicole sitting next to me. You know, the the intersectionality problem here that social inequality is is part of the status quo, right? And it's part of what people are resisting. And, you know, I didn't mention it in terms of citing the research we've done, but in many of our studies, we have looked at dimensions besides gender. And as you might expect, by and large, we see that whenever somebody's located, their social location is in one with less power, they're at higher risk for both sexual violence and um, institutional betrayal. One particularly fascinating finding um, when we look specifically at uh, sexual orientation, we find that um, that in our studies, that the male students who identified as not straight were at higher rates of being victims of sexual assault. But where we saw a <coughs> remarkably large effect in terms of institutional betrayal was for the female students who identified as not straight. They were just much more likely to be victims of institutional betrayal. So here too you see this, you know, some, some nuanced but powerful effect of social inequality playing out in these behaviors. And so then you have to kind of ask, well, what it, how is the institutional betrayal helping the people who are in some sense, you know, making it happen, um, even if what they're doing is just sort of on the surface following the rules? What, what is, how is it serving their purposes and what role is it playing? I think once we uncover all that, we'll have better tools. Thank you. Um, I totally agree. Uh, actually, uh, in my case, uh, my activism with respect to uh, the acknowledgement of the Armenian genocide by Turkish state and society, who still deny it to this day, is what got me into activism, and that gave me the courage, basically, to take on inequities. And once I did that, it was very easy then to go from there to the University of Michigan and see the inequities here. And I guess my activism had given me the courage to move forward. 
But I did things very informally to, because I also thought, like you did, that they would acknowledge and say, oh my God, you're right, we'll do something about this. No, they're taking, they're going in every different direction and I do critical discourse analysis. I can take apart their, uh, you know, the rhetoric very easily, but it doesn't address. And now you told me about all the trauma <coughs> I should have accumulated by now, but I probably normalized and naturalized it at this point. Uh, but what is also uh, fascinating uh, with respect to, to violence uh, is, I think, in American society, I've lived here now more than I have in the, the, my soci society of origin, we have, uh, I had never realized to what a great degree racism has become a part of the American identity. That to me was a surprise, especially, you know, with the Republican response, <laughs> with the January 6 events and the, you know, our, the inability of our legal system to do anything about it. And I think, uh, given the insights I have from my work in the Global South, if you do not acknowledge the collective violence you co commit against uh, um, minorities in the past, uh, you will not be able to have democracy in the society. And if you think about that, there are two foundational violences of American society we have to attend to. The first is the violence against Native Americans for plundering all their lands. And then the second is, of course, against African Americans for exploiting their labor for centuries. I did a very neoliberal calculation, and if we are supposed to compensate them, you know how much we have to pay each Native American? $240 million, and each African American, $3 million. That puts things in perspective when you think about how we nickel and dime them instead and make them into victims. I mean, make them into, uh, you know, uh, perpetrators when they are actually have been victims for centuries and we do not seem to be able to handle that. That to me demonstrates we don't have critical self-reflexivity as a nation and as a consequence we cannot see our weaknesses and faults. So this is my two cents. Uh, do you want to open it up? Or yeah. I would, I would like, yeah, just to say a little bit. Um, one of the things that this conversation really highlights is that oppression is interconnected and they're related to one another. Um, it, my foray into looking at sexual harassment as an academic topic was Anita Hill Clarence Thomas and um, looking at the ways in which her experience was raced and gendered and so and this, these were two powerful people, but it was always relative. And that, um, and I listened to the response of the black community. I listened to the national response, and I was stunned by the lack of understanding of some dynamics that felt really rudimentary to me, um, and the ways in which. Uh, her being a black woman, him being a black man, were really essential to the way the harassment played out, to the impact of it, to the dynamics of silence, to the willingness to engage in this betrayal of her, because historically we have not believed black women could be sexually assaulted. Their uh, rape was profitable for so long in this country. I mean, just all of these dynamics and components that we refused to talk about in those moments and in the decades since. Um, with my, a lot of my original work was on racialized sexual harassment and seeing uh, one of the things we know is that in an environment where there is one form of harassment, there will be others because that is part of the system, the way it's working. Um, and so then when you look at the inter intersected experience, that means women of color are having high rates of racial harassment and high rates of sexual harassment and unique types of harassment that are combining the two in ways that don't get captured by racial harassment measures or, or understandings, nor do they get captured by sexual harassment measures and understandings because it is intersected. And so as we extend that, then we see, um, when we look at campus surveys, we're seeing that our trans students are having a uniquely horrible experience in our institutions. You know, that our gay and lesbian students, uniquely horrible experiences within our institutions. And then when you look at those that are students of color and trans, students of color, gay and lesbian. Like, it's being compounded. 
And it's because we have a culture that says this is okay, that these are the throwaways of society. These are the people that don't quite count and don't quite matter. And so this is the, the ways in which we experience individual betrayals that are then supported and substantiated and expanded by institutional betrayals, but that also really reflect a national conversation and a devaluing that represents this larger betrayal that we have been, you know, we, we have a reckoning that has been 400 years in the making and longer in this country. Um, and so as we're having these conversations, in some ways it's so much easier to talk about it and like what do we do to remediate an individual case than perhaps expand it to how do we address it in a department, in an institution. But really we're going to require a truth and reckoning that's on a much larger level to see really substantive change. Um, Nicole, you want to add? <laughs> you, know, you know, it just makes me think about all of the ways that I've seen these conversations derail in the past. And because these harms are intersectional, what you often see, what I've often seen, is you'll have a group of people who are really, really interested in addressing, for example, gender-based violence. But then, when people start to talk about how intersex with other types of oppression, they start to point out other things that are happening on the campus that are more commonplace, that are considered more socially acceptable, but are so inextricably woven with this gender-based bias. And so I'm thinking in particular of a group of actually feminist scholars that I saw having conversations about, should we strip awards? from people in this discipline who we know have committed acts of sexual violence. And then when the conversation turned into something broader, of, well, is sexual violence, when it's so closely tied to exploitation of academic labor, that's when the discussion broke down. Because then you had a number of scholars who were in this group of you know, self-described feminist scholars who met that definition of having exploited specifically women of color who had worked with them in the past and worried about, well, will I lose my piece of power? And so something that Jennifer said really resonated with me, that a lot of these people who are betraying are not necessarily coming from a place of malice, but they are thinking, wow, I really want to protect myself. If we expand this policy so much, I can think about one thing I did five years ago that would fit under that policy. And I think one of the things we need to get comfortable with to make lasting change is recognition that we've all had some degree of complicity. And that's not to flatten things. That's not to say that therefore nobody should be held accountable because we've all participated in some way, but to recognize that in these conversations, especially as they become more transformative, there are moments when all of us will feel a bit called out. And that it's important, one thing I see derailing these conversations all the time is then that want to protect the self, that want to protect others, and then a complete change of subject from the original goals. And that's something that I think anybody involved in these proceedings has to be prepared for and has to be thinking about, is when will I put myself into that space of empathizing with a perpetrator, into that space of trying to slow down progress, and how can I make sure I'm not going to end up in that camp, and I'm instead going to hold myself and my colleagues more accountable for some really broad changes that yes, if we can eradicate these types of violence on our campuses, our campuses will look hugely different, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Thank you. Do you want to comment? Okay, so shall we open the floor up? Hello again, thank you. Um, I have noticed like a theme in these conversations surrounding like carceral justice, um, like justice, um, and specifically like reactionary responses um, to crime at large, um, and especially when we're talking about who is going to be most impacted by police violence and violence in the legal system. Um, I'm curious if you all have thoughts on, you know, how transformative justice or restorative justice could actually be implemented in these spaces, and maybe how we reframe these conversations around like being afraid of the consequences of having done something wrong. Well, that's a cool question. <laughs> okay, who's taking it on? <laughs> Nicole, are you starting? Which Nicole? Either, either Nicole. Nicole, you can go first. I, I have a couple of thoughts, but I will say that was a, a 
great question with a lot of nuance that I would like time to think more on. But one of the things, um, if we were to transform our thinking about what justice looks like, um, that would actually go nicely in line with what most survivors want. And this is the part that's often overlooked. You know, we, we can easily typecast survivors. You know, they're, they're this castrating, you know, all the things that will go along with that. And, and it's, it serves as a way of diminishing the humanity of the people involved. And, um, and it becomes much easier to then dismiss their concerns when we do this. But if you talk to many survivors, their first desire is, I want this to never be able to happen again. Right? It's a collective desire for healing and for hope and for change that protects the global community, right? And when you even get to the nitty gritty of what do you want to happen to this person, and this varies widely and often varies based on how horrendous the, the experience actually was and whether they see the person as having a, the potential for change. But often when I'm talking to survivors, they would love to see a path for the perpetrator to heal whatever led to them engaging in this behavior. And so, and, and that may involve a punishment for some period of time, but they're often most um, desiring that there be a path for that person to reform and never engage in the behavior again. And so those desires align most uh, clearly with tra with transformative justice and, and restorative justice. So if we are really listening to the desires of survivors, and if we are committed to creating a change in society where healing occurs, um, it, it, there's, a, there's a group that ma called MAPS, and one of their goals is a net zero trauma for 2070. And, um, that's going to require that we really change our approach to what happens when these acts occur. And that we're looking more for transformative and restorative justice. And we're looking at ways where we can actually create true healing. And I think any of us who have worked with a survivor that goes through any of our current justice systems, those systems often are as traumatizing or sometimes more traumatizing than the original event. So our current carceral system, our current justice system is unjust and is not in line with what most survivors desire in the process. So we need to consider really radical transformations and changes. Thank you. You want to add? You want I would to love to. Okay, go for it. I, um, I agree with all of this. And I also think that there's some important considerations around co-optation that there are a lot of universities that are rushing to transformative justice and what they're calling restorative justice that bears no resemblance to what these proceedings are supposed to actually look like. And a lot of them are, again, sort of doubling down on trying to just make sure they're, they're confusing restorative justice with saying we will not actually do anything to the perpetrator. We are going to look for inaction instead. And so what's really crucial is to center survivors in these proceedings. And what I found most helpful is thinking about a lot of the foundational text by abolitionist scholars, black feminist scholars in particular, that really try to decouple this idea from consequences and punishment. So punishment is something that's going to cause harm as a form of deterring this, whatever this act was in the future and saying, we're just gonna make it so painful for you that we hope you'll never do it again. And social scientists know very clearly this does not work, not at all, and that it just creates suffering for the sake of suffering. On the other hand, consequences are things that will provide a tangible benefit, especially to the victims involved or potential victims in the future. So to give you an idea what this looks like, punishment would be something like ostracizing someone from society or giving them a demotion or giving them less pay just for the sake of causing pain. Whereas consequences would be something like saying, well, when you're in this position, you hold a position of power that we have recognized we can't trust you with. And unless we were to see a change in your behavior, which I've more to say on that, so I'll come back to that, um, we don't think you can be in this position of power right now. So for example, we're going to take you out of a chair position for your department, where you have more control over the trajectories of faculty and students within this department or we're going to remove you from a leadership position, or in some cases, yes, we're going to remove you from the institution as a whole because we can't trust you with 
the connections that we give at this institution, we can't pretend to be safe around other people. But the goal here isn't about we're trying to harm the perpetrator in some way. The goal is specifically what will be most protective for other members of the community. So it's a completely different paradigm about thinking of these things. The other thing I'll say is about this change, one of the things that I'm a bit hesitant about with this current moment is I think all of us, survivors included, do say that they would prefer to see change. But there is not yet an evidence-based way to ensure that change will take place in perpetrators' ideologies, in large part because our social institutions still reward them for that perpetration. For example, a very common sanction for a faculty member who has been found responsible of sexual misconduct is to get a promotion to a dean level of a university so that they no longer interact with students face to face as much. Right? And so in that context, it's hard to believe that any of these educational pathways that show promise are going to be so effective because they're undermined by the institution itself. And so that's something that moving forward I'm thinking a lot about, is in this interim period where the educational measures we have we know are ineffective or harmful, what can we do in the meantime to remove structural power from people who may not be willing to change? This is such a fascinating conversation. Um, and I remember one time offering a graduate seminar on exactly this topic. And I, so I was guilty as a professor of graduate students with graduate seminars of picking something I wanted to learn about and knowing that if I put a bunch of smart people in the room and we read something together, I would learn from it. And I was just, you know, so troubled by the problem of justice in this domain. And, um, the whole term, we just read everything we could on different, different justice systems and so on. And we had people, practitioners, who were come in and talk to us. And I, I was left at the end somewhat frustrated that didn't feel that we'd really solved the problem. And one of the issues that kept coming up was this sense of, and I really like that definition you gave about the difference between punishment and and consequences, um, but the sense that restorative justice, transformative justice works best, or maybe can only work, according to some, if you've got a perpetrator who actually is willing to acknowledge they did the thing. And, you know, the, the DARPA response is just like totally not doing that. And one of the things that, you know, I've, I did take away from some of the readings was there is Something you can do with the community, even if you have a, have a perpetrator you cannot trust to be sincerely taking responsibility. And that sort of relates to institutional betrayal and institutional courage because perpetrators are operating inside larger systems and people are colluding with that perpetrator, knowingly or not. And so maybe one thing you really can do with restorative and transformative justice is get the community to take responsibility for their part in having like turned a blind eye when this thing was going on. So I sort of see more hope there um, than, I mean there are some perpetrators who, who sincerely will take responsibility and don't want to continue doing it, but, but um, there are many who won't. But it doesn't, but it, it seems one still could hope that the community, that you could work with the community that way. The other thing I want to say is that um, you know, I already commented, I don't think punishment tends to work for much at all, other than giving people who are feeling fury a kind of short-term, the relief of revenge. And it's very short-term and doesn't make the world a better place, but it's, you know, it's a human reaction and it gets indulged. But I worry that it's not just our formal justice system, but there's a huge amount of this going on in our culture where people rush to shame. And I think there's been a real problem with social media in particular where, um, it, and the problem with this is it shuts down conversation. Because if a person, like what you're describing, Nicole, of we've all done things that we, that caused harm to others. We've all done things that were racist and sexist and, and you know discriminatory on other dimensions. It's just impossible to, I mean, unless you're like a baby, to not have done one of these things. And like one of the things we need to do is give people space to still be a good person and 
understand they've done harmful things. And we live in a culture where that's really hard. Like if you have a conversation with people and you want to talk about sexual harassment, which has a huge spectrum of behaviors, including behaviors that for some people they grew up thinking that was the way it was okay to be, and now they're learning why that's not okay, and they tell you they did this thing, and then the room pounces on them, that shuts down a conversation. If you can create a space where people can say, you know, for years I would tell these jokes, and now I'm thinking, oh, I was probably doing some harm with these jokes. And the people in the room could embrace you for that, that would change it. But that's not the culture we're in right now. We're in the culture right now that's so punitive. Never mind the justice system, just culturally. So I think that one of the shifts we need to make is give people space to grapple with you know what they've done, what they've thought, and not you know, not just chew them up because it sends everyone underground when we chew people up. Other questions? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I, I come from a very STEMI field, statistics. Um, the, the part of my job that's so wonderful in faculty governance is to explore these spaces and hear from such intelligent individuals. It was brought up earlier that the University of Michigan has this brand new ethics, I'm going to write ethics, integrity, and compliance office. And it seems like every time these things come about, the C word comes up, compliance. And I know it came up in the talk that it seems to be a a challenge for everyone in the space, whether you're coming into the system or you're running the system, that compliance gets in the way. Um, I'm just curious the thoughts all you have on, on this, this idea of compliance and where it fits into the system that we have. I mean, it's tricky because I, I do think that we fail to comply with things we should comply with. Um, but an awful lot, besides the problem I already talked about of the compliance mindset problem, but, the, but you know, another problem is that there's lots of bad policies and lots of bad laws. And um, I think it's really important to give people a space to explore ethics and integrity that is not about compliance whatsoever. Um, you know, there's the concept of the conscientious objector, of a person who recognizes that something should not be complied with. And ideally, we live in a world where we don't have to be conscientious objectors, where, where we are comfortable with the rules and we can be law-abiding and policy-abiding humans. But we don't live in that world. And I think we each have the responsibility to evaluate, are the policies we've been told we have to follow are we comfortable following them? I mean, you think back to the Nuremberg trials and you know the excuse, I was just doing what I was ordered to do. And we now don't think that's an acceptable excuse. At times we think that, other times we think it is. Um, but I would say it's not. I mean, I think it's all, you know, that while I very much want to be law-abiding and live in a law-abiding world, that I still have the responsibility to always be questioning, is this, is this right? and not to do something just because it's the rule. An example is mandatory reporting. I strongly feel mandatory reporting is a travesty and can do terrible harm to individuals. And, um, you know, there's a case where I think that people are often justified in not complying with mandatory reporting rules at their institutions because there's a, a more important set of values, ethics, and integrity um, and duties that override that particular kind of rule. Um, fortunately, that you know you don't go to prison for not well in one one state you might, but but <laughs> not this Michigan. State. This is oh this my state? God, this state law. Okay, um, then this is not it's not the only state. But I think it, I'm trying to remember if it was Texas or somewhere there was another one. Yeah, I mean. Okay, that's, that's a case where that carceral state really has intruded on cultural things. But, um, 
But yeah, I mean, I, I think that if you could have an office of ethics and integrity without compliance, that would be healthier. Well, and I just wanted to add, when we think about the harms, and mandated reporting was the first thing that came to my mind as well. Um, I don't, we can't avoid that in this conversation. Um, but one of the things that I think perhaps resonates with institutions more that we often don't end up getting to, um, but we, are, we can very easily understand how mandated reporting is harmful on that individual level. And we need to have more analysis and, and discussion of how it harms the institution if we want the institution to get by and to change. And um, the idea that you're creating a climate where those disclosures don't ever happen, which actually leaves the campus more dangerous because you have no awareness of what's happening or mechanism for intervening, um, as well as I think often institutions need the business case of like, let's count the dollar and cents that you're paying for, for creating a campus where this is occurring. Um, so yeah, I think we also need to be thoughtful about how these policies are harming the institution and how do we have the conversation with institutions at that level? Because sadly, I think, you know, as you said, the, the institution can't love you. That also often means they don't really care much about those individual harms, unfortunately. Oh boy, on that very sobering note. Nicole, do you have to add anything to the other Nicole? <laughs> I mean, I have plenty to say about compliance. We called our consulting form beyond compliance because we're so frustrated by this compliance rhetoric, especially because I just want to highlight that the bar for what's considered compliant with the law is exceptionally low. There's this concept in sociology called symbolic compliance, and it was developed to explain why even though race discrimination had been illegal in higher education for decades, it's still very commonplace in higher education. And it's been applied to sex discrimination in Title IX as well. And one of the things that the researchers found was that judges had a tendency to see any attempt to be compliant as compliance itself. And so one of the things we end up with a lot, you know, talking about bad policy as an example. But, but it's policies, policies that, that we, we know, know are ineffective. And we know they're not doing anything. We know they're causing harm. But many judges will think that as long as there is a Title IX office, doesn't matter if it's staffed, doesn't matter if it's doing good work, it doesn't matter how many students are benefited by it, it, if any, that that alone is enough. So when we talk about a compliance office, I do just wanna make really clear that the bar is in the ground for what that could possibly mean when symbolic compliance is the norm, especially in higher education spaces in comparison to other spaces. The regulations around Title IX in particular, they're just really vague. And this is a big part of my academic work actually is about how anything that's vague or too overly complicated for the general public to understand gives institution powers to truly do whatever they would want. And we're in a moment right now around Title IX in particular where institutions really are doing whatever they want because they have complete control and they can self-govern. They have these policies that are so vague or ambiguous that no one outside of the institution can understand them. And so unless someone, an institutional insider, an institutional whistleblower takes a special interest in your case, you can't actually make it through the Title IX process. And you certainly won't have the information to be able to convince most lawyers to take your case if your Title IX rights have been violated because they can't understand this stuff either. So one of the things that I'm really wishing that we would focus on a lot more is instead of thinking about would a lawyer think that this policy looks good, would a judge think this policy looks good, is something really simple. Would we think that the victims affected would be benefited from this policy? Would it help them or not? Would it hurt them or not? And let that guide a lot of our institutional decision making, because here's the thing. All of that vagueness, all of that ambiguity does allow institutions to take on a bigger role if they wanted to. And that's the part that I'd like to see us challenging the institutions we inhabit to do is to do more to not be so focused on compliance and instead to say, you know what, we want to be a place where sexual violence doesn't happen. And I haven't heard many universities that are saying that specific thing, that we want to end this type of discrimination. Thank you, Nicole. And yeah, I just wanted to add on to um, what you're saying. That a, a danger too with um, compliance a, as a leading motivator for universities is it's a great distraction tool because what universities do is they make compliance laborious and, and absurd. 
And it's almost like you enter this Orwellian world where you are filling out forms and taking little online videos and jumping through hoops and you realize it's stupid and it's wrong, which then breeds cynicism about the whole thing and, and potentially even breeds cynicism about the, um, the purpose of it. You know, where I, I first started to think about this was actually in a slightly different domain and that's the protection of human participants in research. So, you know, there was a time there was no protections in place and researchers could do anything they want and they did terrible things. And so the federal government commissioned a report and required that there be federal oversight for any research for which um, federal dollars are involved. And universities eventually had these offices called IRBs, internal review boards, and researchers go through a whole lot of rigmarole dealing with IRBs. And any of you who are researchers know what I'm talking about. Um, that the bureaucracy has grown and grown and grown. And there's nothing to really stop it from growing and growing and growing. The underlying principle, and the, actually the, there was a report commissioned that's beautiful, it's called the Belmont Report, that has underlying principles about um, respecting autonomy and beneficence and, and equity. Beautiful principles. But the bureaucracy that has grown around this compliance, it's or Orwellian and, and it's incredibly stupid and it interferes with your freedom of speech and your academic freedom and it wastes your time. And the IRB says if you get hurt, it's your insurance that has to pay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it, it's just, it, it's made, compliance actually makes it worse in this situation. It's not just that it's not, the bar's too low, it's that it actually is making the situation worse. And it shouldn't, but the way it's been implemented, the devil in the details, it, it is counterproductive. I, I totally agree. I mean, and in my case, for example, I was doing a study with the Kurds in Turkey, who, whom I knew well because obviously I work on minorities, and here I am having these conversations with the IIB person who's never met a Kurd or seen one, probably, and then he's, they're asking about how am I going to be uh, protecting them or this or that and the other thing, you know, and I, I do that anyhow as an academic. Uh, I don't need the uh, uh, approval of what I'm doing. And I totally, I just finished that, those tests you have to take online. Most of them have to deal with the medical profession. I mean, do you give insulin now or then or whatever? It has nothing to do with me at all in the social sciences on top of it. Yes. Um, yes, go ahead. I guess I would love your thoughts on how, how do we operationalize accountability given all these problems with compliance. So, you know, when you were talking about your uh, institutional courage questionnaire, like, you know, I'm like, oh, we could turn that into a scorecard where we rate universities and, like, see if they're meeting these different things. But then does that just make the rules of the game clear to them so that they can immediately start to try to game the rules? <laughs> um, so how do we, like, we say things like what is measured is what counts and like giving people really concrete steps of how to change their structures seems helpful and once you do that are you just creating this paradox with compliance issues you want to <laughs> I mean, it's a great question I worry about it I mean I don't I think one thing to realize is this is an ever-changing um, process, so any given measure, any given test can be um, gamed. Um, but if one is constantly revising it based on first principles, um, that's less of a problem. So, yeah, I mean, if I, I, one of the ways to, people have often said we should address like, campus sexual assault is basically a consumer approach where um, a single measure is used for every campus that is administered you know, by some third party and then you get a scorecard um, across campuses. Any given measure would vary in quality, but as soon as it's been around for a couple of years, you know, it would be subject to this particular problem. So I think it's a good idea to have you know, a measure that's consistent across universities and to share the results. Actually, it's a good idea, but it, you'd want to design it from the get-go um, that the process of creating it was always rooted in the first principles. What it is you're really trying to measure, 
and then a constant revision process. Every year, you're going to have to change it so that it doesn't become stale. And I mean, going back to the IRB thing again, you know, I, I think some things do need to be regulated. And I think the behavior of researchers in some domains does need to be regulated, but it needs to be thoughtful. We need to figure out where does this regulation need to occur, and then over, each time go back to, in this case, the Belmont Report and say, are we doing this in a way that's sensible? And the same thing, you know, with institutional betrayal and courage and sexual assault, it's got to be thoughtful and constantly revised, which is a lot of work, but that's the way, you know, things that are important, we work at. I think the compliance has to go both ways. I think it shouldn't only keep the uh, PIs, you know, principal investigators. The uh, unit administering it also has to have compliance and accountability for what it is doing. I think part of our problem is bureaucracy is like comes this iron cage, as we say in sociology, and in a way, once you're in it, when even if you make a mistake or uh, you're at fault, you don't follow through, whatever, they constantly silence it and whitewash it so that in the end you do not, nobody gets punished. I mean, or at least nobody gets to account for what they have done to you. You cannot hold anyone accountable for what has happened to you. That is the problem. And that is a problem of the bureaucracy. I mean, we really have to study the administration as a bureaucratic unit to see what the weaknesses in it are and come up with ways, I think, you mean smaller committees, with faculty on it, whatever that would transform the bureaucracy because they're not capable of transforming themselves. They're capable only of reproducing themselves because of the way they're approached uh, everything. At least that's my chance. You have two sides? Well, one of the things that occurred to me in your question is that in some ways what you're getting at is also the need for culture shift and culture change, where we are actually valuing the underlying tenets and the, kind of the first principles. Are we, are we getting at um, the desire that, was the, that uh, Nicole, you mentioned of we don't want this to be a place where this is happening, and then we allow that to guide what we're doing and the policies we're making versus we want to be able to tick the boxes um, to you know, send the report off to the federal government. And um, the drive for compliance has definitely done that. And so looking at things that are actually measuring culture and climate, and uh, those are a little bit more difficult to game because you're getting them from this wider group of people. But, um, yeah, then we get into the will of the institution. Is this where they're willing to put their time and energy? I think we've seen that's often not the case. I kind of echo what was saying about accountability of the institution as well. It's, whole, it's hard to hold individuals within the institution accountable if the institution itself is not accountable. And so I want to echo what other people have said all along, which is this conflict of interest where universities can let their own concerns about risk management, about protecting themselves and their most their most prestigious people, right? There are certain very high esteemed professors or donors. In my research, I find the children of those professors and donors are, per are perpetrating violence at exceptionally high rates because they're beyond reproach. And I have had a lot of optimism thinking about there are a few places in the US that are starting to think about how to remove this conflict of interest and how to hold the institution accountable. Um, I gave testimony in support of a bill which passed in the state of California to move victim advocacy offices. They're still on college campuses, but they are now staffed by independent employees who report directly to the state instead of to the university. And explicitly in that law, one of the things they wanted victim advocates to be able to do was help students file civil lawsuits against their university if their Title IX rights have been violated. That is a very different scenario than what we're thinking about right now, and it would change the incentive structure pretty significantly. I agree with what other people have said, that having those external third-party evaluators is really crucial for making sure that there isn't that tug on everybody of we want what's best for the school because that's going to be best for my position within the school, right? Um, 
before we'll have a chance to have this kind of larger agency created or something like that, I think some interim things that can be helpful is to have things like regular audits, is to make more of what's happening within Title IX offices public, to pass laws that require that it's public, which exist in places like New York and Maryland. And that can go a long way into at least equipping the general public with the ability to join the conversation. Whereas right now in most schools in most states, they're just sort of watching it and they're horrified by what's going on and they have no idea where to start. And it would mean a lot if more people that were involved in this conversation were coming from that perspective of just a concerned citizen who wants this type of violence to end. Thank you so much. And we are, have time for one last question. Who's going to ask the last question? Yes? Oh, come on. The late, okay, go ahead. Yes, perfect. No, 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 nobody has their hands. So I was going to call them. Call, okay. call them. Well, this is really, it's really been fascinating, and I'm looking forward to dinner. Um, what I was going to say kind of follows up on what uh, our SACUA chair, Tom Braun, asked about um, compliance. And um, having been on faculty senate and SACUA, and now chair, secretary for I'm in my fifth year, and I'm just watching as we have been able to shepherd these changes uh, through the university system. I was part of a, a um, subcommittee where we worked with Elizabeth Armstrong and all. So this is all coming out of faculty senate work. But, uh, but when you talk about compliance, I'm starting to feel like, Irk, here come the breaks. OK. And this is our chance. You know, we have a president. We, wanted a president who would do this, but now we still need to be able to advise him and his office. And I'm just thinking, what can we do? I mean, if this was the last chance we had, because we have had some, you know, <laughs> issues, um, but I was just taking notes about the state that you mentioned, helping to pay people, uh, pay for students. and. And it's not just students. We find that graduate students and staff are some of the most vulnerable people to sexual abuse and harassment. So I just wonder, you've already said a couple of things, but I'm just concerned about if this is our last chance to really have some accountability, what can we, how can we advise our administration in the way to go? Because they're looking toward us. You said it a minute ago. Look at Oregon. Right? I mean, that's something you said when, when I asked you a question. Because the biggest issues here in terms of compliance and mandatory accounting and everything may be things that Oregon really has dealt with. Yeah. I, what um, is being referred to here specifically is a mandatory reporting um, non-policy. It's a policy, but it's not mandatory reporting um, that we were able to get through at or if this is at the University of Oregon, um, it's called mandatory supporting, and um, faculty and staff are required to do what the student wants them to do. Essentially, if the student wants it um, to go up, you know, to a more official report, that faculty and staff has to help them if that's what the student wants, but, and if not, then the faculty and staff has to um, respect their privacy. Um, there's other requirements like providing the student with a, a central website address and. Um, some training in how to be supportive and call the faculty staff member has to call a certain number to talk, make a you know have a confidential discussion just to make sure they've done it right. So it's it's doable and um, and this could this is you know can be a model for other institutions. Um, it's in one of the things that helped us get this passed was we had a law professor as part of our working group who wrote a law review article showing that the this kind of policy was better for the institution, which goes to a point about, you know, you have to convince the institution it's in their interest too, because they don't care about the individual. But it is better for them too. And um, so th that's, a, that's an example where it can be fixed. And I think having a good mandatory re or good reporting policy goes a long way. But the other thing I want to say specifically to your question, if I was going to make one easy to implement recommendation to pass on to a president, is that that president make a commitment to, on some regular basis that gets spelled out, maybe it's once a month, honor a truth teller. 
on, with that truth teller's permission, you know, some truth tellers are not going to want this to happen, but truth tellers that are, are um, happy to be publicly honored, and that that president send a message out to the whole campus honoring this person, and make it the culture to honor people that are telling difficult truths. I think that would make a lot of change pretty quickly. Well, I forgot to mention, I think ours is going to be kind of our outside of people will be the regents. I think that's, I, I just got nervous and forgot. But I think as we were looking for an outside accountability, I think the regents, the Board of Regents, were going to be our outside accountability, Who to whom the president reports and so So, and, and the regents had been on our side for this change and so so I guess maybe it won't be as dire as I was thinking but these are some great recommendations especially the mandatory supporting as opposed to reporting that's that's just to say uh, there is one um, pivotal article that um, was written by two University of Michigan people and me um, the first author is um, now um, she's now a, a assistant or associate professor at the University of Nebraska, but she was a graduate student here named Catherine Holland, went by Katie Holland. She was first author. Second author is Lilia Cortina, who's a professor here, and I was the third author, and it's called Compelled Disclosure. It was published in the sort of flagship journal for the American Psychological Association, where we trace the sort of, it, you know, the, the data, what, what universities are doing, and the psychological data about these issues. And I find it hard to believe that anyone could read this article and not want to change their policy, but I can be naive that way. Um, there's a follow, there was then published commentary about it, and we had a follow-up um, response to some of that commentary where we talked specifically about the Oregon policy. Um, so anyone who wants that, it's all on my website, but you can also email me and I can send you a link. Thank you. One comment about regions is that the regions are very important, of course, but they're elected by the people, and their priorities usually are not the educational system or knowledge production. They are much more into uh, businesses, laws, politics. I mean, you know, and their priorities in this neoliberal capitalist system that we live in are mostly financial. And that has been a, a, a very terrible way to decide on things because. Uh, institutions, educational institutions are counter-economic. They do not, you know, run by the same. So maybe it's the combination of the president and the regions would be a better solution than just going with the regions oh, yeah. or with the president. Yeah. You want to say? I also, yeah, I would like to say, if you're thinking about things to recommend, um, at MSU, Rebecca Campbell, myself, and Katie Gregory, and, and a couple of additional people were, worked on a campaign called the Support More campaign. And uh, the, there's resources that you can go to. And, and really, the goal was to change the culture of the institution and really being able to make it so that all of us, you know, whether you talked to support staff or faculty or to another student, that there was knowledge about how to actually be supportive to a survivor and how to respond in that moment. And a couple of the pieces of it was making it clearer to everyone who is a mandated reporter and who are the offices where they are protected from that requirement. So, and making sure that staff were uh, quick to make that very clear, what is their role. Uh, that we identified the offices where students could talk uh, confidentially without uh, that triggering a report. So kind of a blend of like, these are the people that are kind of more of the uh, mandated supporter model. I love that model, by the way. Um, but again, this if you're going to have this requirement stay in place, how do we empower individuals to make the choice of who they're then talking to about their experience so that they are not put into this, this situation where it's being reported against their will. Um, but yeah, we have resources. We, we have a paper that we're submitting on the process, but that you could go to the website and look at some of those resources. But that was a way of um, how do we create the climate change and the culture change and provide information to people about the resources that are available, how do you access them, actually giving people language. What might you actually say in response to a student that just gave you a disclosure? Because often we found, you know, 
not to pick on statistics, but you know, the statistics or mathematics professors were like, I, I don't know what I would say in that moment, and I have nothing in my background to prepare me for this disclosure. So giving people the language, um, giving people example, and really trying to focus in on how do we make the entire environment one that's more supportive. Nicole? The other thing that comes to mind for me, I want to echo all of this. This is all right on about how to make sure the reporting experience is something that survivors have control over and how to make sure it's a more positive experience. But the other thing that I want to pull out is that there is a reason that practitioners like us don't recommend mandatory reporting. And one of the reasons for that is that because the Title IX process itself is so re-traumatizing for survivors. And so one of the main reasons it's so traumatizing. We have the process itself. That's sort of a broader, separate conversation. But one of the more proximate issues that survivors refuse to report or are fearful to report is because they're worried about retaliation. And that's something I think that more schools should be thinking about is better anti-retaliation policy. A lot of schools, I don't know Michigan's policy that well anymore, uh, but a lot of schools' anti-retaliation policy just comes down to a single sentence that says, don't do this, if this is prohibited. And then if that retaliation policy is, if it's violated in some way, what schools will do is say, we're going to open a separate investigation into whether or not retaliation occurred, but we're, we're just going to put this off until we're done with the initial investigation. And that's really problematic for a whole host of reasons. First of all, it still allows um, a perpetrator in particular to continue to meddle in an investigation, which means the efficacy of the first investigation is completely compromised. It's creating harm for the survivor who's sort of expected to just endure this retaliation. And it has this implicit understanding that the university thinks that, well, whether or not we think this retaliation is appropriate depends on the outcome of our investigation. And if we decide that there is insufficient evidence in this case, then we're going to treat this the same as a false allegation and say that the retaliation is totally merited. And that's a culture shift that needs to change. Retaliation should always be considered unacceptable. Frankly, no matter what the outcome of the original investigation or informal process might be, there's a lot of informal proceedings happening now too. Um, the vast majority of these cases are handled informally now. But there needs to be a sense that retaliation is never acceptable and it needs to be taken very seriously. I would actually argue the order in which these things are done should be reversed and the retaliation proceeding should take precedent over the other investigation for many of the reasons that Jennifer said during her talk, which is this is something we can see happening right in front of us and it deserves, it merits consequences no matter what. This is violating a policy. But the other thing I want to do is talk about this broader cultural shift around the burdens that we put on survivors to come forward, that we basically tell them the reason they're so vulnerable to retaliation is because our universities look the other way when this type of violence is happening in plain sight. And we say, unless the victim is going to make a big deal out of it, and then you know, put that in big quotes, that's the way they think about it that the university would prefer to just ignore the violence that takes place. I was really stunned for my dissertation. I spent a year at one university and I interviewed victims, perpetrators, and administrators. I oversaw very many Title IX cases during this time. And I was stunned by how many of them happened in public in front of faculty and or staff who could have been the ones to initiate something. And I, I just want to say that this is like different than mandatory reporting, right? It's this idea of, I would like us to think about what it would look like to protect survivors by retaliation by saying the university is going to create a cultural shift where we don't want this to happen and we're going to take action. And we're not in cases where it happened publicly and we saw it and the facts are not in dispute at all. We're going to take that action and a victim doesn't have to participate. We're not going to waste your time. We're not going to exhaust you. We're not going to re-traumatize you. And it's going to shift the frustration from how dare this individual victim report to, oh, it's the school that has this broader culture and this is the way that they're responding. I can't think of any schools that are taking this exact approach, which for an immediate, if this is our last chance attempt to do something, we often do want a clear model to point to. But I do think it's something that Lilia and Cortina and I had spoken about um, in the alumni magazine for Michigan in the past. And I think it's something we should seriously consider is how do we make it clear that this is a university goal, if in fact it is, as opposed to sort of a thorn in the university side, which is the way that these reports are treated right now.
Exactly. Well, thank you so much uh, for that and uh, to all our audience for uh, attending uh, this amazing transformative event. May this be the beginning of very significant changes at the University of Michigan, given the wisdom that uh, you all three share uh, going forward. And thank you all for participating, especially you, Jennifer. And it's good to know that there is a lot of work that's been done that could help. Uh, move us forward. So thank you for putting this together, uh, University of Michigan Senate. Uh, take care and thank you.